we have uh, Dr. Katri and Professor Akbar from Australia and from other continent far away below Indonesia literally because right now in Canada is maybe early morning professor is that true oh yes and we have professor David from Canada because today even and tomorrow and the day of the tomorrow is very limited seated uh, you can see there's no enough space so we uh, broadcast this even live in YouTube so I already spread the link throughout Indonesia yes to metallurgical association so everyone can listen very very important lecture from our distinguished professors o okay first maybe we please uh, we give applause to Professor Kang to give the lecture. Time is yours, Professor Kang. Yes. The slide will be there. Can I use this? I'm sorry, Prof. Kang. <laughs> See you later. Push up student in the class if they are sleepy or yeah. Test this. Okay. I'm sorry, Professor Kang. This is correct that you are the first uh, lecture. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Nico, push up, Nico. Nico, push up. Push up once. Just kidding, Nico. Okay. <laughs> you have all this strong muscle. Okay, Professor Kang, please. Time is yours. <laughs> Nice to meet you again. Prasadia, <laughs> please have a seat here. Oh yes, okay. You can sit here. Yes. Okay. It's okay. Yes. Please, Professor Kang. Uh, nice to meet you. My name is Yunbe Kang from Pohang University of Science and Technology, Korea. And it's my big honor to come here. And thank you very much, Professor Santoso, to invite me here with very well-renowned world scholars, my colleagues together. So uh, I was asked to give a lecture to the student. And I really had no idea what should I do. But <laughs> I presume that this is kind of the classes giving in a university for undergraduate student or the graduate student. So I chose the topic which you might hear the terms in your classes, thermodynamics, phase diagrams, and the surface tension calculations. So I'd like to show some of these topics. It will be very fundamental, but I hope you find some interesting point. So let me first introduce my, uh, myself. The I got my PhD at the, my university post-tech in 2005, and I did my postdoc in Canada. Uh, at that time, my supervisor was Art Felton and Patrick Chatron. And the group is very well known for the software called FactSage. And in this the lecture, I also deal with some part of the FactSage. And at that time, here the Professor Daniel Lindbergh was my colleague there, so we worked together there. And then I am now working at the post-tech. The my department is Graduate Institute of Federal Technology. And at the same time, I was operated in the Department of Material Science and Engineering. I work on the mostly steel. I'm working on steel making, the clean steel, refining. And as an academic, the topics I work on the computational thermodynamics called CalFET using FactSage and something else. 
So this is Korea. Some of you may know, some of you may not know. This is South Korea and eastern coast of South Korea. There is a city called Pohang, my city. And inside the Pohang city, we have our campus postage, probably. I think using this is better. A river runs through the Pohang city and the southern part, a streaming company called POSCO. And this is our campus. The population of my city is around just half a million. This is the air view of my city, and this is Posco, and we have some nice beach, and if you come to Poang, then you can enjoy some nice the seafood there. And my university, Postec, Poang University of Science and Technology, this was established in 1986 by Posco, so we are private university. Total of students is slightly less than 4,000, so this is a very small university, just focusing on science and technology, like you do here. And this is the numbers, not very much interesting to you, so I pass the next. This is the, I was asked by university whenever I go somewhere to give presentation, my university asked to show this, but this is not very important. And one, thing, one good point is, is our university has the accelerator laboratory. We have the third generation, fourth generation, so this is quite good to have deep investigation. You have this is kind of very high quality X-ray. You can even see the alive mosquitoes, their heart vibrating yeah, with this. Yeah. <laughs> and this is some number. We have a small university, but we have really research oriented. So we have some number of funds and publications. And let me introduce my laboratory. Laboratory of mine is called Clean Steel Laboratory. This was initiated by my former the professor. And this photo was taken in this, the spring. I have a number of students and postdocs. My main research area is the basic chemical metallurgy, computational thermodynamics, relation kinetics in the academic terms, and applying to steel making, refining, and recycling for usually the ferrous scrap or some industrial waste. So this is main topics. In academic terms, as I mentioned, I do some fundamental things, uh, experimental determination of phase diagram, some of the modeling for the many different phases, metal phase, oxide phases, the thermodynamic calculations, and relation kinetics, and physical chemical properties to support some important properties which can be applied to real process. The typical I have done research on clean steel production, for example, the steel product, high core steel, for example, automotive steel or electrical steel. This is now very important to be a part of electric motors in the electric car. This looks a lot of cleanliness inside. At the same time, recent issue is decarbonization of all the industry, not only for RMX steel making, but also other steel, the other industries. So, in the first metal field now, the hydrogen are making becomes very much important. So we not really like to mitigate emission of CO2 from our RMA making process. So let's replace it by hydrogen. But my point is the how to get the hydrogen. So I also working on the hydrogen production these days. This is some of my research the facilities of my lab. There is some induction furnace, resonant furnace, levitation melting furnace and some other microscopy. And this photo was taken, I think, in this room 10 years ago. I was sorry, I showed this first to you. <laughs> 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 Professor Julhan invited me kindly, and I gave a lecture here. And you see that the sleeping <laughs> Professor Akawa Ramdani, because my talk was so boring, so he <laughs> <laughs> didn't must listen. <laughs> and I visited one more six years ago with my dean of GFT. And this is recent list topics of my laboratory, as I told you, clean steel production, or low carbon are making steel making, something like that, and the hydrogen production. But today, I will not show this one. This is because of research topics, but since this is a lecture series, so I want to move to some more the university lecture type contents. First, start with thermodynamics. So you took course thermodynamics, okay? You know everything. 
And in metallurgical side or material science, we usually deal with Gibbs free energy. With the Gibbs free energy of all the materials, let's say as a function of composition and temperature or even pressure, and if you have mathematical equations of Gibbs free energy, then you can do many, many things, including calculation for phase equilibrium, phase diagram calculation, or if you take some mathematical operation, you can find other important properties like enthalpy, internal energy, or if you do some math, the partial derivatives, you can get chemical potential, activity, something like that. This gift free energy is actually a function of temperature, pressure, and number of moles of the compounds. At the same time, you learn that gift free energy is H minus Ts. This is what we learn from thermodynamic course. But do you know what is different between energy and free energy? When you say, in your daily life, when you say energy efficiency or energy crisis, is it internal energy or free energy? When you read newspaper, you see the energy, it means it's more related to internal energy. Free energy is a kind of tool to decide whether our system is on the equilibrium or not. It's kind of tool. So this is less sensible compared to internal energy. Energy is really energy you can measure, you can sense like a heat. So there must be some relationship between something real heat like enthalpy or heat capacity to give free energy. If you take some information from thermodynamic textbook, then from the Gibbs energy, you can get the enthalpy or heat capacity. This can be measured by the calorimetry or the DSC. If you have experiment data for this kind of real sensible the energy terms, then you can get Gibbs free energy. On the other way, if you have Gibbs free energy as a function of those properties, temperature, pressure, or composition, you get some mathematical operation to get enthalpy or heat capacity. The same happens for phase equilibria. If you have phase diagram, you can get Gibbs free energy and vice versa. From the Gibbs energy, you can get phase diagram. Even physical properties can be obtained. When you say the free energy, energy, enthalpy, those things, it looks like a chemical terms. But like a volume, looks like a physical term it can be also obtained from Gibbs free energy. So if we have Gibbs free energy as a function of those variables, it can be quite useful. See, now I want to connect between the thermodynamics Gibbs free energy with the phase diagram. This is phase diagram of binary light alloys, aluminum and magnesium binary phase diagram. I'm sure you read it. How do you read it? There are the two axis variables, temperature and composition, let's say mole fraction magnesium, and there are a number of phases. Suppose let's focus on this temperature, 250 degrees Celsius. From left hand side to right hand side, let's read the stable phases. We have FCC, beta phase, intermediate, let's say intermediate compound or solution, and gamma phase non stereometric intermediate phase, and HCP. In the middle, we have two phase regions. At this temperature, such kind of phase stability or phase element can be obtained if you do experiment. If you measure the phase element, it's possible. But this phase element was calculated from Gibbs energy equations. For example, at this the same temperature, 250 degrees Celsius at 1 atm. This graph shows gives energy of all the solutions which you have seen in previous phase diagram as a function of composition. This is gift free energy of FCC solute solution. This is gift free energy of HCP solute solution. This is beta phase. That this is that of the gamma phase. 
And in textbook, we learn that draw a straight line. I don't know what this is, but draw a straight line and try to touch two phase simultaneously. Then we say this is common tangent line. Once common tangent line is made, then this tells us that between this point and this point, so this composition, this composition, there must be two phase. One FCC with its composition and the other beta phase with its composition. So we can find the stable phases and stable phase composition from this Gibbs energy equations. At this point, this point, you can find different phase stabilities. Combining all this gives you the previous phase diagram at 250 degrees Celsius. You do the same thing at the different temperatures. If you have Gibbs energy curve for each phase is at different temperatures, how do we get? In order to do that, we should have Gibbs free energy equation as a mathematical form. This is Gibbs free energy of FCC solar solution as a function of temperature and composition. This is assuming simple regular solution model. So Gibbs free energy of FC solar solution is available as a function of composition and temperature. Gibbs free energy of other phase, for example, liquid phase, is also available as a function of composition and temperature. Then you can draw this kind of curves at different temperatures as you wish. Then doing this kind of calculation gives you the phase equilibrium. This exam shows just at 250 degrees Celsius, but you can do the same thing at different temperatures, merging all this information, then you can now get complete phase diagram. Calculating this thing, we started from drawing common tangent. Common tangent is concept given in our usual thermodynamic textbook. But this is exactly the same to find minimum of Gibbs free energy of the whole system. For example, this common tangent. Along this line, you are in the minimum state of Gibbs free energy of the whole system compared to other choices. So calculating minimum of Gibbs free energy of the whole system gives you the equilibrium of the system. This is what usually the computational thermodynamic software does. So computational thermodynamic software has equations for Gibbs free energy of all the interesting phases as a function of composition, temperature, or even pressure, and do calculation to find minimum state, minimum value of Gibbs energy of the system. Then it gives us the equilibrium state. Now, let's move to phase diagram. Left-hand side, this is a simple binary phase diagram, AB binary system, temperature, and composition. There are a number of phases liquid, gamma phase, and alpha, beta. These are the thick curves of phase boundary, and the horizontal lines are tire lines. So tire lines are the line connecting two points. These two points represent composition and temperature at the equilibrium. For, for example, this line gives you equilibrium composition of liquid at this point, and equilibrium point of gamma phase at this point. So these are very well known. Right hand side, the same phase diagram, A, B binary system and temperature, but now there are many number of lines. These lines are not tire line, but these are, for example, here, this is phase fraction of beta phase. Here on the right hand side, we have beta phase. If you are here, then phase fraction of beta is 1. If you are here, phase fraction of beta is 0. And this part, you know that this is alpha plus beta 2 phase region. Then phase, phase fraction of beta is greater than 0, less than 1. You know that. These numbers give phase fraction. For example, if you follow this curve, this gives you the information that phase fraction of beta phase is 
0.9, and this is the solidus, so solvus of beta phase, exactly the beta phase, the phase fraction is 1. Then on the other side, you have less lower phase fraction beta decreasing, and here, the solvus of alpha along this curve, the phase fraction of beta is exactly 0. Then you can might find that along this curve, beta is 0, and where you should go to find beta? 0. All this range, of course, phase fraction of beta is 0. And here, this is gamma plus beta 2 phase region. Then 0 0.8 of here, 0 0.8 is somewhere here, 0 0.6 somewhere here, and this, this curve. Above this curve, there is only gamma phase, so beta is 0. So this curve gives you phase fraction beta 0. Then if I track 0 phase fraction of beta, then it should go in such a way that you follow this line. <coughs> this is 0 phase fraction of beta. Now I like to talk about this concept, 0 phase fraction line. This phase diagram looks similar to previous one, a little phase diagram, oxide system, CAO, MGO, binary phase diagram as a function of temperature and composition. There are alpha phase, CAO rich solution, beta phase, MGO rich solution, and liquid here. Now, I want to follow zero phase fraction line of alpha phase. This is alpha. Here, phase fraction of alpha is one. Here, phase fraction of alpha is zero. In the middle, phase fraction of alpha varies from 0 to 1. Where is phase fraction of alpha is 0? Here. Liquidus. And here, and below the eutectic temperature, there is alpha plus beta 2 phase region. So 0 phase fraction line of alpha phase should go here. So all the red line gives you 0 phase fraction line of alpha phase. Similarly, if you find zero phase fraction line of beta, it should go here. Zero phase fraction line of liquid follows this yellow line. Below this yellow line, you cannot find any amount of liquid. Above this yellow line, you can find even very tiny amount of liquid. So this yellow line gives you exactly zero phase fraction line of liquid. Then in this phase diagram, we find three zero phase fraction lines, alpha, beta, and liquid. You merge all these things, it automatically gives you phase diagram. This is a logic to calculate phase diagram in computational software like FaxAge, ThermoCalc, or Panda. So at each point, if you can calculate equilibrium, so in order to do that, you should have Gibbs range equation as a function of composition and temperature for all the phases. If you can calculate equilibrium, you can also calculate the phase diagram taking this concept. This is even complicated system, four element system. Even this multi-component system, you can calculate phase diagram. This is isothermal section at a fixed temperature, at a fixed carbon content, but you use mass fraction of vanadium, mass fraction of chromium as an axis variable. If you calculate zero phase fraction line of individual phases, you merge it, then it gives you phase diagram. So this is logic basic logic to calculate phase diagram. Now I want to introduce various types of phase diagram. Some of these may be well known to you, some of those may not be. Yeah. This is most typical binary phase diagram. Temperature, composition. So iron chrome in binary phase diagram. This is most typical phase diagram we learn in even the introduction to material science engineering or thermodynamic courses. Let's add one more component, three component system. This is CAU SI to AL23 tunnel system phase diagram looking very complicated all the axis variables. 
This is again the same phase diagram which I just showed before for compound system. Again, we have a phase diagram, but this phase diagram was using two variables, weight percent chromium, weight percent vanadium as an axis variable, x variable, y variable, but we fixed composition of the third the last element carbon. And of course temperature was fixed at 850 degrees Celsius. Now we come back to single component system, unary phase diagram, Rn. But now look at the axis variable, temperature. There is no composition because this is single component. So this is pressure. So typical PT diagram. This is another type. The three element system, manganese, titanium, oxygen. But now X variable is slightly different. X axis is ratios of metallic element only. Manganese, titanium, molar ratio. Here, no oxygen is involved. Y axis is partial pressure of oxygen gas. So this is chemical potential of oxygen or activity. Temperature is fixed. This type of phase argument is also available. This is typical when we deal with non-metallic system. This is oxide system. Now let's compare. Let's analyze. I bring back four phase diagrams. Left hand side, iron chromium. X axis was more fraction of chromium, so composition. Y axis is temperature, most typical. Second, single component system. X axis was pressure, total pressure. Y axis was temperature. Now different. The third phase diagram, three component system. Here, X axis was not the more fraction of titanium, but this is cationic fraction. Only you calculate ratio between metal element. So cationic ratio, Y axis was partial pressure of oxygen. This is not total pressure, different. Partial pressure of oxygen. Last phase diagram, four element system, four component system. Here we use weight dependent chromium and weight dependent vanadium as an X axis and Y axis. So there are different types of phase diagram, different rules for selecting access variables. So how do we decide that? This is a rule to choose phase diagram access variables. Suppose you have three component system. It may be one component, two component, or even let's say 10 component system. We select following C plus two thermodynamic potentials or intensive variables. Since we have C components, there must be C number of chemical potential of these compounds. And we have two additional, temperature and pressure in, in thermodynamics. So total we have C plus two thermodynamic potentials. For each potential, there is a corresponding extensive variables. For example, in case of temperature, this is intensive potential variable corresponding extensive variable is entropy. Don't worry about I don't tell about the entropy anymore. <laughs> pressure, this is potential. Corresponding extensive property is volume. But since if you increase pressure, volume decreasing, so there is minus sign here. Chemical potential of a compound corresponds to number of moles of the same compound. So there are corresponding relationships. If you write this in mathematical form, then this potential is obtained by taking partial derivative of internal energy with respect to these extensive variables. Now, how to choose the axis variable? Suppose from the previous table, you choose either intensive potential variable or extensive variable. Just one out of these two, not both. Then define the size of system 
as some function of selected extensive variables. For example, you may set total number of moles of the system constant or volume constant, then normalize the chosen extent variables. Then third, chosen potentials and normalized extent variables are then C plus one independent phase and variables. Here, you just chose two because we always throw x and y, and the other set constant. I read these sentences, but I have no idea what this means. So let's try the examples. Let's come back to RN chromium binary phase diagram, typical temperature composition phase diagram. Here we have two components, so we must have two chemical potentials here. And in addition to that, we have two additional temperature and pressure. These appear always. This is potential variable. There must be corresponding extensive variables. For temperature, this is entropy. For pressure, volume. Chemical potential of Fe, number of moles of Fe. And chemical potential of chromium corresponds to number of moles of chromium. Here, what sh we should do is for this law, you choose either temperature or entropy. Here, you choose either pressure or volume. So this color variable was chosen. Temperature, pressure, number of moles of Fe and chromium. Then what we do is, I first choose this one as Y variable. This is my choice. And I like to choose X axis variable, but what it can be is normalized extensive variable. So I'm not using number of moles of this element directly, but I use normalized one because phase diagram does not tell us size of the system. Okay, so it must be normalized. So normalized variable is mole fraction of chromium. So number of moles of chromium normalized by size of the system. So I choose this as x axis. Y axis was this one. Then remaining one, pressure. This is health constant. In this phase diagram, pressure is 180. Almost all the phase diagram we look at is defined at 180, unless it is specified. Let's choose the other one. <coughs> manganese, titanium, oxygen. Here I have three components, manganese, titanium, oxygen, and temperate pressure, and corresponding extensive variables. I chose these five colored variables from columns. <coughs> I have temperature constant. I have total pressure constant. I chose this normalized variable, normalized extensive variable as an x-axis, remaining one, chemical potential of oxygen. This is related to log scale of partial pressure of oxygen. So this is chosen as y-axis. Then phase diagram is clearly defined. Up to now, I discuss about thermodynamics. And thermodynamics is how it is used to create phase diagram. And in the phase diagram, what kind of axis variables are used? These x choice of these x variables must be consistent with, consistent with thermodynamic principle. Now this is my last topic, surface tension. Then why got the certain surface tension? You know what the surface tension is, okay? This is one of physical chemical properties of material. Now look at this equation. Gibbs free energy change. When you first take the thermodynamic course, you first look at this equation by merging the first row of thermodynamics and second row of thermodynamics, minus SCT plus VDP. If you extend your point of view to open system, then some amount of compounds now contribute to size of the Gibbs free energy. So number of moles of I multiplied to chemical potential of I 
in the C compound system. This is currently up to discussed in typical thermodynamics. But if you consider very small size system, let's say nanomaterials, then since area to volume ratio becomes greater and greater, so surface energy plays an important role. This graph shows melting temperature of gold as a function of size of this gold particle. At the large size, this is typical melting point of gold, which we know. But decreasing size lowers melting point of this um, melting point of gold. It means at the low, uh, small size, for example, this is 50 angstrom, 5 nanometer. Liquid phase becomes more stable than solid phase. There must be some change. And this is explained somehow by considering surface energy of the gold particle. Surface energy contribution is shown here, sigma times dA. Here, sigma is surface tension. A is surface area of the material. So this term tells us that if you increase surface size, area, as much as dA, then surface tension times change of the surface area gives contribution to gift free energy. This is very similar to adding some number of moles of I, then this contributes to gift energy of the system by multiplying chemical potential of I. Then here, you find some similarity. Number of moles of I is extensive variable. Here, area is also extensive variable. This is chemical potential. Then surface tension is also kind of potential variable. Then in the phase M construction, we have separated two terms, intensive the chemical potential terms and extensive variable. Here, surface tension becomes intensive chemical potential term and surface area becomes extensive variable term. Now I want to use this relation to calculate surface tension of material as a function of composition. Surface tension of a uh, AB binary solution for example, this is calculated by taking into account the phase equilibria of the system. Here, we suppose the free energy of the whole system of this solution. We assume that it is composed of the bulk phase and surface phase. This gives the bulk gift energy, and this gives you surface gift energy. In order to explain all details how to get this equation and explain this one, I need to have additional 30 minutes, then you will die, so I just pass it. But the important point is to get surface tension of a B binary solution, we consider a B X tunnel system where this X, the third element, is hypothetical element. This is not a real element. We are just interested in a B real binary solution, but to get the surface tension, we consider a hypothetical or fictive element which imposes surface property of this solution. So here, AB binary system, this is ABX tunnel system, but this is a real system, AB binary. This Perfect. is bulk phase. And with this element X, I have AX and BX, this is surface phase. And we assume that this bulk phase and surface phase are in equilibrium. Prof. Kam, yes. excuse me, you have 10 minutes left. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I'm finishing, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Within five minutes, yeah. <laughs> then, <laughs> we can calculate the equilibrium using some of the software. It's quite simple. So the point is, calculating equilibrium between this bulk phase and surface phase, you get chemical potential of this hypothetical element X. This becomes automatically the surface tension. 
Then, this is phase diagram. Left hand side, this is normal phase diagram. A, B, oxygen, real system. You can draw phase diagram in such a way, or this way, or this way. A, B, metal ratio, and the chemical potential of oxygen, as I showed before. On the right hand side, this is A, B, external system. Here, you can calculate phase diagram between metal ratio x, x variable and the chemical potential of x. But I mentioned that chemical potential of x gives you surface tension. The calculate phase diagram, you can calculate this one using software. There are two phases, surface phase and bulk phase. This is very similar to the calculation for normal system, for example, alloy, metal alloy oxide system. This is automatically calculated from the software. So this is one example, A, B binary system, metal ratio, and this is chemical potential of X. Software calculate these two lines. Below you have bulk phase stable region, above you have surface phase stable region. This low line gives you chemical potential of X of this bulk alloy. So you can get this chemical potential of X as a function of composition of this AB binary system. But this is just simply surface tension. So this is a real example. I calculate surface tension of iron silicon liquid alloy as a function of composition. These symbols are the measured data and these curves are calculated surface tension. But in software, software does, does not know whether this is surface tension or not. It just calculated chemical potential of the element X. But this is automatically surface tension. All these are real numbers used in the calculation. So, thermodynamics is a little core principle for you and even for us in material science and engineering. You should study very hard. It can be applied in many, many different places. Phase diagram is a way of plotting equivalent state of materials based on thermodynamic equilibrium principles and various types of phase diagram are available beyond what you see in the thermodynamic textbook. There are many different types of the thermodynamic phase diagrams. And now using CalFET software is now nowadays very daily routine tool. You should be vulnerable with using this kind of software. And surface tension is one of the thermal functions like chemical potential. So it can be calculated using CalFET software by combining these zero phase fraction lines and surface tension with a view as a chemical potential. So this is one of application using thermodynamics and phase diagram, which look somewhat far from physical chemical properties like surface tension, but they are all linked to each other. So you can connect all these things. And one more last slide. I'd like to show my former student came from this university. I have two students previously. And now she is working in Canada. He's working in Jakarta, and I'll meet him this afternoon. They were really excellent students, and I really enjoyed doing research with them. And they actually published a nice paper together. So this is a really positive outcome between the communication between my university and ITB. I look forward to meeting more talented students from ITB. Welcome to Posting. Thank you. Woo. Thank you, Prof. Kam. It is, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt your, your presentation because it is so amazing. So now it's time for questions. So for students, you can have time to ask question to Professor Kang, please. Usually our student is so shy, Professor Kang, as you know. They have to be kicked first and then look. After I warn them, I have to be like, okay, raise hand. Okay, please mention your name and yeah. Good afternoon, Professor Kang. Uh, introduce me. My name is Ilham, and 
I want to ask about the properties of surface tension in the uh, binary system of metals. Uh, so usually in our class we talk about surface tension in um, mineral beneficiation such as flotation. Uh, in alloy development such as uh, you uh, explained before, what is the correlation between uh, the materials properties and the surface tension that we calculated? Uh, thank you for the time. Uh, sorry, what is uh, the material property you mean? Uh, I mean like what does the surface tension place correlate to okay. so I think mm. maybe yeah. One very important one is, as I showed you, the depression of melting point of small size particle. It is also related to surface tension of surface and material. And also, um, you have learned the term called Oswald Leibniz. Small size precipitation and much smaller precipitation. If you have both two, then smaller precipitate disappears and is merged to relatively larger one. This is also surface tension plays very important role. And in my case, I work on cleanliness of liquid steel. In the liquid steel, there are small particles like pre-states we call inclusion. They are floating each other. Due to surface tension effect, sometimes they merge each other or sometimes they never collide each other. They move away from each other. This is very important. And in parametrical process, Suppose you have a vessel. Vessel is lined with ceramic refractories. And this vessel contains liquid metal and non-metallic slags. Then we find triple point, refractory, slag, and metal. At the triple point, we should observe rapid corrosion. This is because different surface energy properties so there are accelerated corrosion appears, which can be ex explained by surface tension of these three different materials. So surface tension plays a really very, very important role in many types of material science and metallurgical engineering. So finding some, uh, having some good the knowledge about surface tension is very important. Okay, thank you, Professor, for the answer. Any question again? You want to ask? Don't push your student too much. <laughs> 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 no, I will push them. <laughs> I will angry with them. Why you don't ask? Let them like something like that. <laughs> okay, give applause to Prof Kang. Thank you very much. Yes. Next lecture is from Professor Taskinen and Professor Lindbergh. And please, time is yours. Right oh, yes, Professor Lindbergh. Checking, checking, yes, it's working. <laughs> Hello. So my name is uh, Daniel Lindbergh. <coughs> I'm a uh, the associate professor in uh, Metallurgical thermodynamics from Aalto University, from Finland. Uh, and here I, 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 we will, me and um, Professor Pekka Taskinen, we will, we will hold sort of a, two, two joint, or a joint presentations, slightly different topics. Uh, and I will mainly focus here on, on uh, let's say, studies and research in metallurgical engineering at, at, at Aalto University. So as Professor Kang mentioned, uh, Actually, I, I, I have worked with him when I was in, in, in as doing a postdoc in, in Montreal with the developers of FactSage. So I have a, my background is actually not directly in metallurgy. I have a, I did my master's some 20 years ago in geology and mineralogy. Then I, I did my, my doctoral uh, degree in, in high temperature inorganic chemistry. And since uh, 2018, I have been at at Aalto University. Uh, before that, I was at, at another university in Finland, and also, as, as, as mentioned, in, in, in Canada and in, in Norway. Uh, the, the theme over that, that connects all my, my previous work is it's always been relating to melting different things. You're melting rocks 
we're melting uh, salts, we're melting ashes, or we're melting metals or slags. So that has been the, 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 the common theme. And uh, yeah, in teaching, I mainly 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 deal with with uh, you know teaching also the the graduate students uh, and the thermodynamics uh, mainly related to metallurgical engineering. Yeah. Let's see if this works. Yes. So start. Hello. Yep. So starting off, so in case you don't know where Finland is, this is now from Google, Google Maps. You see, so Finland is in, so here is Bandung. There is Finland. Uh, it's a country in Northern Europe. We call it the land of the thousand lakes because we have, we have, I don't know if it's, it, it's many hundred, perhaps hundred thousand lakes, but, but also we call it land of the midnight sun. Because in summer, the sun doesn't set. In winter, the sun doesn't rise either. But uh, <laughs> but uh, and and so it's it's we we're a small country, five and a half million people compared to Indonesia, where it's almost three hundred million. Uh, if you look at this map, Finland looks like it's almost as big as Indonesia, but this is this is an illusion. This is not actually. <laughs> True. So, so the size of Finland is about, uh, let's say, six times, or, or Indonesia is six times larger than Finland. And and the, our university, Alto University, it's uh, in the in the capital region. It's not in Helsinki, which is the Finnish capital, but it's in Espo, which is next to to Finland, uh, to Helsinki. Uh, yeah. So actually, if you re looked at at the real size. This is Java, and and this is Finland. So, northwest in Finland is about the same distance as east east west in Java. So, so as I said, these these maps, you know, the, the the Earth is round. So when you put them on a, on a flat surface, then then it, it starts to become distorted. So, as as mentioned, I'm from a university called Aalto University. It's actually one of the newest universities in Finland. Uh, we like to say that uh, in these different university rankings, Aalto University is often in the top, if you look at it alphabetical order. <laughs> but uh, but, but it, I would say it is still the, perhaps the main, main university in Finland that, that, that educates uh, uh, university level engineers. Uh, and, and, and the reason is there that it, it actually, 13 years ago, it was merged from three universities. It's the Helsinki University of Te Technology, where, where we still have the old campus is, 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 is where we have the current campus. And it merged with the University of Arts and Design, <coughs> as well as the Helsinki School of Economics. So uh, we say that Aalto University is the science where science and arts meets technology <coughs> and business. And, and, and if you wonder wh where does the name come from, actually Aalto, it's a, the word Aalto means wave, but it doesn't come from that. It comes from one, one of the, the, let's say, the world famous uh, architect and designer uh, from Finland called Alvar Aalto. And, and, and yeah, actually, a lot of the houses, uh, buildings at our campus was designed by him. Uh, so this is used to be the main building at the Alto University campus. Uh, that what, that that was designed by him. It, it's what you call a functional style of of, of architecture. That was uh, perhaps in the I don't know 40s, 50s, 60s, <coughs> and still so, sort of to say that that. Uh, the, the university is divided into six different schools that we call them, where four of them are in engineering related. You have electrical engineering, school of engineering, school of science, and uh, metallurgy. Here we belong to the. Let's see where is the, is the school of uh, chemical engineering, and then we also have the school of business and school of arts and design. And, and specifically, our school of chemical engineering is uh, 
divided where we you know we we focuses on 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 developing su sustainable solutions and breakthroughs related to to bioproducts biosystems that's one one part chemistry and materials but metallurgy we belong to the department of chemical engineering <coughs> and metallurgical engineering and, and and just to sort of show there here's the from from our department the group of professors that are are working there and specifically we're currently uh, five five professors with five different research groups so it's the Professor Ari Jokilakso in, in pyrometallurgy, he will actually retire soon. So hopefully we'll get a, a, a new professor by the end of the year or beginning of next year. Professor Gasik, he's currently not, he's been sort of material processing powder metallurgy. He's not been working with metallurgical applications so much the last couple of years. But Professor Maria Lundström, who's in hydrometallurgy. Rodrigo Serna is in mineral processing and recycling, and then, and then me that's in in metallurgical thermodynamics. Um, Professor Pekka, who will present here after me, he was the he he founded the, the research group in metallurgical thermodynamics and modeling that that I'm now heading. Plus, we have then se several other uh, professors more in, in in what we would call traditional chemical engineering. <coughs> so. And, and I think here I'll just mention some some of the re research that 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 we are doing, <coughs> the, the different metallurgy groups are doing. So Professor Lundström, who's also the vice dean of of research at our at our school, she's uh, very been very successful in building up the, the research in in hydrometallurgy, especially related to to both extraction and recycling of battery metals, which of course of course you know that that that's you know, globally, it's, it's it's very important now that we need to to the more and more nickel, cobalt, this type of of metals are needed, but also recycling of, of for example, batteries from from electrical vehicles. And and Professor Serna, he he is then more in this uh, mineral processing, mechanical. Processing, also recycling, frost, uh, di studying different fr frost flo flotation, uh, also looking at this sort of uh, various type of parameters to see that that uh, are, are these various different new processes uh, sustainable. Looking at something called sustain, like this various type of entropy analysis, these type of, of things, and then I go to so actually here I I, I sort of lumped together the research groups of <coughs> of pyrometallurgy and metallurgical thermodynamics because we are actually very closely coordinated coordinated with each other uh, and uh, this is a picture from from some of our research in in our groups we are very international we have people from Poland people from South Africa Korea China even Finland, uh, and, uh, and and actually he, David here, who's not in this picture, I thought I had him, is one of my PhD students, he's from, he did his uh, bachelor degree here at ITB, yes. and then he came to Finland, did his master's in Finland, uh, and is now sort of the final year of his uh, doctoral studies. We had to check that he's, he's, he has the proper Proper safety gear on the, the 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 jacket, the gloves, and the and the glasses. I think I forgot my glasses here, so <laughs> <laughs> we. I suggested perhaps I need to Photoshop this picture and put some glasses on me. <laughs> so first, so as I said, the 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 this uh, Arioki Lakso and, and and my our groups are very much uh, doing work together. Ari's focus has been on. <coughs> On looking at, looking at chemical kinetics of, of various reactions in metals production, also doing, uh, for example, different type of process modeling, CFD modeling, uh, where uh, and well, this is, for example, related to settling of, of, of uh, metal mat through a slag layer, 
and some pictures from our, from our labs. And, and, and also just to, for you to mention uh, to mention to you that so this is a, a schematic of a, of a flash melting uh, furnace. So if you don't know that this technology was mainly you know was developed in in Finland <coughs> starting almost uh, 75 years ago, and 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 uh, I think Professor Pekka was uh, was teaching some 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 engineers when they're you now building a new one. In, in uh, is it east, Eastern Java? So you can talk more about that if you want to later. But and then my back, as I said, my my focus then is more on the. If Ari was looking at the kinetics, I look at sort of the the end state, the, the equilibrium. Uh, <coughs> so chemical thermodynamics or so metallurgical processes. Also, due to my background, I also not only look at at various type of uh, Pyrometallurgical process also looking at uh, corrosion rela related uh, combustion related issues, both experimental work and 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 uh, and modeling, um, and actually some some thermodynamics related to to, to aqua systems. So David is doing his work on, on aqua aqua systems. I think this, this picture is actually from a paper that the Imam. Wrote when he was uh, still when it was a postdoc at, at Alto. So, so as, as, as you will see, we have had a, a, quite a lot of connections here, especially with ITB over over the years. So, what do we do? This is some some pictures of of, of our infrastructure. We do a lot of high temperature research with various type of furnaces. Uh, often. Small scale, meaning we are looking at details, chemical details. Uh, and one one example is that we we have our, our samples in in various type of horizontal or no, sorry, typically vertical uh, tube furnaces that we then quench and analyze. So this is actually on repeat. We don't have 25 samples coming out all the time there. <laughs> so the, this is one sample. What it looks like. So when it then it. it Goes into to cold water. You take the sample, you you analyze it, and, and based on this, you can then uh, you, you you do chemical analysis. You can use that to to <coughs> so for example to to figure out. I think here is uh, various trace elements from at various conditions. Here that in, in slag, for example, as a function of oxygen partial pressure, or as a function of time, or here as a you know. Based on this, you can also uh, get experimental work, uh, results for for deciding uh, phase diagrams that you then use, for example, in developing thermodynamic models. Uh, and here, so, it has, so we work with synthetic materials, industrial materials, and then do this uh, advanced chemical analysis also that that we do typically in collaboration with with the geological survey back in 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 Finland. <laughs> so perhaps then uh, I will talk something about also uh, the studies at Aalto University related to metallurgy. Uh, so in Finland we have the system that we you do a bachelor degree, and after, uh, that's three years. That's the sort of the European type of system. You do a three-year bachelor degree. After that you can apply to a master's program. And do a two-year master's program, and if you still want, want you can then continue and do a doctoral uh, doctoral uh, thesis. That nominally should be around four years. Uh, the bachelor actually ba bachelor's programs are are typically in Finnish. We have actually in chemical engineering <coughs> uh, uh, a new English uh, degree, but of course here that that's not not necessarily of. Of, of interest to you because you're all, um, at least I'm, I'm guessing here that, that at least at the bachelor studies level already. But uh, but we actually now so we have these different uh, uh, master's programs. We've been renewing our master's program. So from from next year, from next fall 2024, we will have a new. Previously it was called sustainable metals processing. Now it's uh, Sustainable metallurgical engineering, 
it, it's not very different in content, but 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 I, I think I still can mention mention this. So this is uh, master's level studies, and all master's level studies at Aalto University are, are in English actually. <coughs> and and students with a bachelor degree in, in let's say chemical engineering, metallurgical engineering, minerals engineering, chemistry, are are are, are eligible to apply to this program. It's actually a part of a chemical and metallurgical engineering program. Uh, typically, what what can be mentioned that that uh, studies in Finland uh, are 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 not free for 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 students coming outside of European Union, but you know, best applicants that from outside of the EU are always eligible to get scholarship to to cover these tuition fees. So. If, if at some point some of you would be interesting to, to come to Finland, please consider this. Uh, but also one thing, contact some of the metallurgy professors to get some recommendation letters. That's, that's always always good. But what, what does a sort of a, a graduate from metallurgical engineering at Aalto, what, what does that mean? It's, I, th I saw Imam showed earlier, we had a internal meeting where you show that what 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 is it so what are, what is expected of you when you graduate is I, I guess pretty similar all around the world but but you have you know need to apply knowledge of mineral processing pyrometallurgy hydrometallurgy different type of phenomena there to develop and design metals ex extraction and recycling processes evaluate and design evaluate design and performance of of these processes and and act as a metallurgical engineering expert you know, in multidisciplinary groups in the industry, academia and, 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 and public sectors. And this is pretty small, but, but also, so the way I don't, the way it works in Finland that in the master's studies, which as I said, it takes two years. So typically w the way it works that the first, first semester you do some common studies with chemical engineering uh, students. You learn the, the fundamentals of, of mineral processing, hydrometallurgy, pyrometallurgy. Uh, chemical thermodynamics, and then you choose various sort of uh, specializa specialization topics, so either pyrometallurgy, hydrometallurgy, uh, or recycling, for example. And in, during the second year, the, the second semester, you actually write the thesis, typically re related to some of the projects that we have or connected to to some industrial work, so sometimes students are, are directly uh, hired by, by the industry to, to work on this project. So if anybody at some point is, is, has the interest in this, I think there's the application runs is at the end of this year until beginning of January. And uh, here is even the link there if you want to, to look at this. So make some advertisements. Why come to Finland? Okay, <laughs> I don't know. If it's good or bad, the snow. So it, winter we have cold. Snow is nice. It lights up the, the sky when it's dark. But uh, based on on some sort of surveys, World Happiness Report, Finland has been the happiest country in the world for, for several <laughs> years consecutively. Uh, Finns are always wondering what do they mean. Uh, we are not happy, but but <laughs> but but anyway, uh, it's one of the sort of least corrupt countries in the world. Supposed to be one of the safest countries in the world. And we have the cleanest air in the world. Perhaps the reason is that, yeah, there are not that many people, so there's enough space also. Uh, but, but that that's that's well something. Um, then perhaps also some words about our collaboration with ITB. So we, I think, so, since 2022, we actually made a official memorandum of agreement between between our our, our universities where. We want to initiate and facilitate and, uh, this cooperation between our universities, especially related to inter you know, exchange of, of, of staff and, and students, with focus here now on the metallurgical uh, research. And, and, and what you can say that here we have two, some, some examples, two recent uh, doctoral theses that were made at Aalto University. This is by, by Imam. His thesis, is this your hand also? Yes. <laughs> and uh, he, so it, it was in pyrometallurgy and thermodynamics. 
and also one in by Arif Aji in, in, that was uh, connected to hydrometallurgy that 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 was I think defended uh, about two years ago and Arif moved back to Indonesia recently also and actually this year 2023 we have had especially in in, in our labs metallurgy and thermodynamics lab we have had a, a very big uh, a group of, or a lot of, of Indonesian visitors Imam was there during the 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 summer Hausan Nabil were all just came back from from Finland they were there over the summer I think they are bachelor students Fauci he was there earlier as a also a visiting as a bachelor student and then Fadli and Lid Fadli was there uh, during the the spring and, and Lina is, is still there doing some experimental work uh, so so there's uh, Imam has been active at, at, at sending very good students to us uh, <laughs> and, and researchers yeah so perhaps uh, I, I, I stop there I don't know if you know what this is this is the Aurora Borealis the northern lights that you can see in the winter when the sun, it's actually from magnetic storms from the sun that, that lights up the sky. Uh, so with this, uh, say first, thank you, Kitos. Terima kasih banyak. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Daniel. And next is the Professor Taskinen. And then after that, we move to Q&A. Yes. Okay, yes. So, good afternoon. My name is Pekka. Pekka Taskinen, former professor of, of Aalto University. And uh, I won't talk, talk uh, here in, in my presentation about, about Aalto University so much, but probably I should start mentioning that, that I'm one of those very few professors, or was one of, one of those very few professors in Aalto who had significant industrial background. I was more than 25 years in Autotech and Autokumpu company uh, working in R and A research and, and development of flash melting, but also other smelting technologies, which which were were uh, developed and and uh, sold uh, industrial to an industrial companies in the world, and uh, that was horrifying thing when uh, when I finally got got position full full professorship in Aalto University some. Uh, 15 years ago, and, and uh, I was the only one having any uh, industrial background, and, and all my colleagues were were really uh, afraid that that guy might might be might be a threat to to them. But but uh, I tried to be on friendly terms all the time, and and, and uh, didn't do any any big harm I hope uh, but I will talk now about something you probably will meet at a bit later stage of, of your studies when when you when you are considering publi to publish something in, in scientific journals and and uh, this is about this is this talk and the story is, is, is about my background, my history, my scientific history uh, also with uh, and, 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 uh, and collaboration with, with, uh, with other universities over a rather long long time of, uh, of, uh, of a peri period of time. So, so this, is, this is something uh, that is uh, close-up uh, of, of Northern Europe uh, and, and, uh, and really this is what you may know, France, Spain, 
UK, uh, and and also here it. What happened? Here it looks like like Finland is 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 a, is a big country. It, it is true. It, we are about the so size of of Spain or a bit bit larger than France. Uh, France, so so we are by area quite big and, and you, if you think about five million people in there so so there is really space space and, and uh, this is the capital uh, of Finland Helsinki which is some some 450 kilometers west of St. Petersburg so Russia which is now in war with, with Ukraine in, in trying to invade it and, and we are th at the same distance from Stockholm, which is the capital of, of Sweden. So, so clo uh, this is this is our campus area here. And nowadays, we have very uh, and we have had always rather good public transport there. And and we got a couple of years ago uh, metro going through our campus, and it's it's 15 kilometers by road to, to Helsinki city center, but it's only 11 minutes by, by tube or metro. So, so we are in, in a quite nice environment, as you will see also in my last picture. And, and now about, uh, about my, my story, how, how we are actually developing, developing scientific knowledge in, in this area. And this is not specific, I, I think, to uh, metallurgy at all, it, it is it is uh, common, at least in all these engineering sciences where fundamental research is is nowadays not so popular, and that, and that is why we are we are actually we are actually uh, <laughs> accumulating uh, fundamental uh, knowledge uh, in only couple of places, most publications in, in, in our engineering area, they are actually specific uh, cases which, which uh, not always can, can, can be translated in more common, common knowledge. They, they, are, they are specifics which, which uh, are as such informative for, for, for that research group and for the company who has probably uh, ordered those those uh, studies, but uh, but uh, if you try to generalize the data, it, it's not so easy. So I I found probably 20 years ago this paper, which is uh, which was published in Canadian Metallurgical Quarterly, and and uh, the authors here are are my at, at least him is is one of my old friends from University of Melbourne and and, uh, and uh, I was wondering why they are referring and, and kind of splitting into, di uh, into, into unit uh, kind of findings. My research which was actually done 25 years earlier and, 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 uh, and uh, I, was, I was wondering why this kind of thing is uh, presented by Neil Gray and, and his group uh, now, because actually we did publish those those data. In in was the first pub paper was was 1980, and 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 a couple of others after that. That so so. Then I was starting to to wonder what is the kind of driving force of 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 of, uh, of doing this kind of this kind of, of um, kind of introduction into the field and I, I noticed that since our work uh, initiated probably 1975 actually nobody was looking at these these things and they they were probably the next one looking at that at, at uh, on on a scientific level they were Lots of uh, how to say uh, commercial papers from from refractory uh, makers uh, to endorse their, their products and, and, and applications they wanted, but but 
actually nothing was was published on the fundamental level. So so this this is this is how how Neil Gray explained our or kind of simplified our our findings in there. So he said that that when when uh, ceramic refractories which are used in in metallurgical uh, reactors protecting the engineering structure steels from from hot slags molten molten metals and 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 and, and, and mats how 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 that that uh, that interaction can be divided into uh, mechanisms which which are 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 how to say active there and and in 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 con copper converting uh, conditions which is the severest uh, condition for for refractories in in copper smelting so it is copper converting step and and really really uh, the reason i i don't have any analysis of of the situation but it looks like when i'm looking that paper and our study is 50 years ago uh, so so it 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 looked like uh, there was domination by by brick makers uh, and and uh, domination in such a way that that they wanted to uh, sell a lot of bricks and and they wanted to be that company who is selecting the uh, the lining and making the linings on behalf of of the smelting companies and and in a business that is a very nice situation your customer doesn't know anything about refractories and you you are selling them probably with a good price and you you are installing them in in the in the in the smelters and and uh, customer is saying thank you yeah we uh, in eight, 1980s we educated Finnish metallurgical metallurgical industry very much with these bricks and and th they started to make their own decisions they didn't listen to the recommendations of of of, of refractory brick, brick make makers very much and 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 uh, and nowadays it is a must to have have deep uh, thorough knowledge knowledge about about refractories because actually your operational conditions are are what are determining the the cons consumption of of uh, of refractories and thus they are they are determining the campaign lives and your productivity so, so they are key to 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 that which is actually making the money money in in a, in a, in a smelter smelter and smelting company so so copper converter batch wise operating converter here here is here is a sketch of about that it's more than 100 years old vessel which which is which is making blister copper out out of, of copper mat which is produced in as you know in in, pri in the primary smelting furnace which may be flash melting or or whatever blast furnace even even and and, and this is a rather demanding uh, place for refractory uh, materials and and, and uh, typical lining interval is, is probably one month so so these are quite big big units and 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 uh, there is always at least one in copper smelter for relining, waiting for for use, and two or three <laughs> blowing. And and traditionally, and all these these uh, refractory refractory makers, they they are studying the chemical wear, which is the most kind of unpredicted thing. Uh, in 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 this this system they are they're studying it them with very crude uh, uh, techniques uh, like like this cup test where where 
refractory material is is actually actually uh, put in a, in a in a in a cup which is uh, which is uh, made out of refract uh, refractory and and this is the slag or some other material and the, these are heated up in, in the furnace and, and followed after one day two days or so in most cases no atmospheric control uh, control is done this is typical finger test which which is which is also a static uh, bath of of what we want to study and the, these are these are fingers made out of uh, different refractories and we follow the dimension changes in the, in there so so and and this is a rotating uh, furnace which always is in air and and this is what what uh, brick makers are recommending you, uh, recommending to you if you wish to wish to study uh, refractory wear but it's always in air and none of our real processes are are running in in air so this is what uh, is pretty much the, the situation in, in refractory brick uh, research in 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 the world uh, and in applied uh, kind of circumstances so so when when brick makers are are doing doing selection for for certain process and process conditions and, and that is what they they are using and this is the outcome of a brick. This is hot phase, this is cold phase from a uh, copper converter, uh, this batch-wise operating copper making machine. And, and we see dissolution here, we see densification of, of the material. So, so this, this original brick is, is mostly magnesium oxide MgO, and then there is some 15, 20 percent chromia to keep, keep it in, in, in good condition uh, against the uh, slack attack. And, and, and uh, this hot phase, there's a layer of slack and then densified zone which is coming from uh, chemical interactions with, with, with slack and then, then, there is a, then there is a layer of, of copper and copper mat which tells you that this densified layer and this mostly original brick they are physically separated by by that infl infiltration zone which is partly coming directly from from here and partly uh, along joints between the bricks and and uh, these interactions are leading to the actual where of, of refractory, not chemical by chemical dissolution, but by spalling and, and, and peeling off of the densified densified uh, zone. Yes, we, we can calculate nowadays nicely as, as we heard earlier, all kinds of things also with slags, mats and, and, and interactions of slags with uh, refractories, for example, and this is an ex example of of, of MGO dissolution uh, solution uh, uh, solution into 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 uh, pure iron silicate slag. Like how 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 much we we can dissolve, and we will dissolve at high temperatures in in turbulent turbulent uh, copper converting conditions in Pierre Schmidt vessel. And and uh, and uh, these uh, these diagrams with this is uh, this is uh, liquidus surface isotherm plot uh, made by MT data, which was me not mentioned earlier, but this is one of the oldest oldest solvers in 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 computational thermodynamics. I have been using it since early early 1990s, but it's, it dates back to to. to mid 70s so 25 years before fact sets was was launched into market so 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 these are extremely useful tools for for process engineers and as as said earlier you should you should uh, know 
and learn how, how to use the software uh, when you are uh, in this business. So why we have chromia in, in, in those, those refractories, uh, that is a simple thing if, if, if as we know it now. Actually, we didn't know that, that before, before some, some five years ago, when, when we started wondering what, what on earth is, is the solubility of, of chromia in uh, typical copper smelting slags. And, and we didn't find too many uh, publications about that in geochemical literature nor in metallurgical literature. And, and we have now measured it a couple of times times and, and, and in, in, in slags containing uh, no lime but also with lime, lime uh, uh, additions which, which may, be, may be used in, 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 in certain, certain cases in, in copper and, and nickel industry. And it, uh, the solubility is, is pretty low. It, it's, it's of the order, this, these are the really weight percents of, of, of chromium. Uh, so in 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 copper smelting conditions, uh, we are at around 0.1 percent of of chromium. So with, uh, that is uh, kind of increasing the viscosity on on the surface of of the brick, and and stops the chemical dissolution. Uh, so that is why the peeling off is is the major major uh, mechanism in. In, in the in the industrial copper converting conditions, and and um, 50 years ago we were in, in in this kind of situation that our industry. I was a young young doctor, a student in in present Aalto University, and we were asked by Swedish and Finnish copper making industry that how we can understand something about about uh, slack brick in interactions and and we were quite aware that these rude kind of simple systems uh, measuring systems were used but we we took something which is which is more kind of sensitive and we started using using these these uh, methods which are called seesaw drop experiments uh, that that means that we have a solid substrate which is now 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 brick and th then we have uh, some molten material and we are measuring measuring first the contact angle of of that system as a function of of temperature as a function of oxygen partial pressure as a function of sulfur dioxide pressure and and this this droplet is how Less than half a gram, o o point, o point 0.2 or 3 grams only. And, and once we, we have measured this, this wetting angle uh, and, and we have this force balance of, of, of the surface energies, so we quench this, this system and, and examine interface and compositions of, 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 the, of the connecting or the, or the phases in, in, in connect, uh, connection and, and, and examine how molten material has been, has been uh, flowing there and, and going into, into the microstructure and porosity of, of, uh, of, the, of the brick. And uh, we could see then that, that that uh, pure copper without any oxygen, without any surface active elements, sulfur, oxygen, selenium, tellurium, those, those are the, the, the major players in surface activity uh, of, 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 of copper melt. Without those, we have a wetting angle of, of, uh, of more than hundred degrees and that means that the droplet is like this. But when we are increasing uh, oxygen concentration in, in the droplet in copper, we are we are we are lowering the, the wetting angle and 
90 degrees is, is, the, is the limit where, where this molten material starts to impregnate and go into porosity of, 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 of the brick. So, so we see infiltration, which was, at that time we did these experiments, which was regarded commonly as impossible thing to do, to, to, to see. But, but, uh, but that was the case that we, we, we managed to publish these, these results in, in, in spite of that, that all, everyone said that these are not correct. This, this is oxygen-free system and this is oxygen-bearing system. And, and they are be behave, this is as a function of, of temperature, this is as a function of oxygen concentration. And, and, and the reason is here. This is the effect of, of uh, classical, classical drawing of, of the, the effect of surface tension or surface energy. So we have, we have here kind of uh, driving force is, is, the, is, the, is the surface energy energy and, 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 and the height of, of, the uh, of the liquid column is, 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 is determined by, by surface tension, uh, wetting angle, uh, radius of, of the, of the, uh, of the um, capillary and, and then, then, then uh, acceleration of gravity and, 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 and density. So, so you can actually measure some parameters using using this kind of arrangement at low temperatures with with some surface active element uh, uh, substances like soap or something and water. So, so this is this is classical physics from from 19th century. We also saw that that the same happens with with copper mat which was also something industry and, and colleagues uh, from academia said that you don't see matte penetration in, in, in refractories, never. But, but we measured that, that wetting angle as a function of iron to copper ratio. Here is pure copper sulfide and, and here is copper matte. Matt, so, so it's mostly below below 90 degrees, and we see in in these seaside drop experiments that it's going. Go, Matt is is infiltrating and filling the the porosity, and and uh, there's no doubt about it because it is actually dictated by that that wetting angle property. And and what does that? that infiltration, uh, infiltration of matte do in, in the refractory, it starts to feed uh, iron in, into the, into the M MGO phase. And uh, when we are adding, this is the binary or quasi-binary phase diagram of, of iron, oxygen and MGO. So it starts, infiltration starts to dissolve iron from mat in, into, into, the, into the MGO and it starts to uh, lower significantly the, the, uh, the melting point of, of, of MGO, so magnesium ferrite, uh, magnesium uh, uh, gustite phase and, and, and that means that, that those grains start to grow together. They're, they're the, the densification of the hot phase is, is due to that, that, that phenomenon. So some years later, 10 years later, so, so Leuven University summarized, summarized the, the, the kind of phenomena there and, 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 uh, and also reasons uh, for, for refractory wear. So mechanical, thermal, chemical components, weakened structure, and, and then, then we have spalling as discontinuous where when the converted temperature is going like that, and, and then we have, uh, have other mechanism as, as, as uh, continuous dissolution of, of, of refractory bricks into, into the slag, which is uh, meaning that your Fluxing is, is not in, in control. So we are 
we are summarizing all that that in in uh, in later studies and and uh, and it's pretty much set, said in here here uh, what i explained earlier but today uh, continuously operating uh, metallurgical high temperature furnaces like flash flash melting flash converting furnace which is under construction in 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 Gresik now uh, so so they don't actually use uh, refractories of that type anymore any elsewhere than than in the heart in the bottom of the furnace and this is the critical point, point, point and cri critical part of the furnace and there all these uh, these uh, infiltration phenomena are active <laughs> not so much this chemical dissolution but this furnace design and, and the heart design is is based on those facts i showed you and they are ac actually actually done by by autotech after we we find out what is really happening in the in the refractories the the heart heart design is is completely di different from from that we had in in, in 70s and and uh, it is uh, cooled by actively by by blowing and and why bricks are not any more important in in these stati stationary furnaces uh, not batch wise but continuously operating is that all other pla all, all other parts of, of the of the furnace it's it's cooled by water and and it's so-called cooling jackets which which are generating this kind of uh, freeze lining which that that is our freeze lining experiments we did some 15 years ago a lot at the university and it tried to explain how it grows how fast it grows and and, and what is the structure so, so this is the engineering example. What kind of uh, cooling jackets are are in in flash melting furnace? So, there is uh, in big furnaces 500 tons of those those cooling cooling jackets, uh, and and all these cooling waters are continuously monitored for 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 measuring hotspots and and heat losses. Okay, this is what I had in mind, and and uh, during this about 50 years time, I have been in in this this business. So there's a lot of things which have happened in 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 real uh, smelting technologies, and and uh, even if if we have couple of these continuous double flash uh, lines and, and continuous smelting smelting uh, mm. even in in direct to blister mode there's still hundreds of Pearsmith converters which which are operating in the world and and they are uh, keen to know why one converter is is uh, eroding spalling off and why in their other smelters probably in the, in the same company why converter is growing what what is the difference and how what is the mechanism so so still well you are retired when 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 all Pearsmith converters have been converted into continuously operating technologies so so you need this these these things in, in in your work and be aware that that there is actually now some some information available this is this is the list of references of of the pictures i i have in, in my slideshow uh, they're mostly mostly from from our group but there are also a couple of couple of others so Thank you very much. This, this is <laughs> this, this is Aalto University from an other angle, and then Daniel presented. And and if you have any further questions after this session, so this is my email address. Thank you. 
Okay, guys. Question and answer. Oh, one, two, three. But maybe only one because time is limited. Okay, Abrar. It will the lecture will be forever in YouTube, so you can <laughs> play anytime. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you, Mas Imam. Uh, hello, PK. Uh, my name is Abrar, and I am a master student in metallurgical engineering in Institute of Technology Bandung, and I am interested in computational fluid dynamics. Uh, so my question is, uh, can we predict the chemical attack? Uh, mechanical attack and thermal attack on refractories using CFD. I mean, uh, with CFD we can get uh, almost all the spot uh, that potentially get attacked by slag uh, to refractories. Thank you. That's, that's a very good question. Actually, uh, one would expect today that, that, that all the material properties of, of, for example, refractory materials are known. All the, all the material properties of, of Molten and solid slags are known, or 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 solid uh, mat, they are not. So that is the biggest obstacle. Basically, we we can do that. We 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 have activities in that area, but because of the of the kind of uh, present situation in in scientific literature, a couple of years ago, uh, Prof. Ari Jokilakso started to applying money for, for thermal conductivity studies uh, at elevated temperature. And now we have flash laser, uh, laser flash uh, thermal conductivity device, which, which is, uh, it has been used probably one year or a bit more for measuring thermal conductivities and, and, and thermal diffusivities of, of uh, basically only, only solids, but it, it is, it is it can be used also for molten molten materials, but but yes, computational methods are 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 capable of doing that, but w not without uh, fundamental property data of, of 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 substances, and that that is something we are lacking. But perhaps after ten years or five, it's doable. All right. Thank you, Abrar. We will have an official time after this. If you have still curious, you have a lot of questions, you can directly contact Professor after this, okay? And now we move to Australia. Please welcome Dr. Avarma and Professor Akbar. Check, check. Hey, everybody. So nice to see many students here. I was thinking I need some stretching. We all need some stretching first. Because okay, we are halfway like here, so let's do some nice yeah. stretching. Dr. Avarma, he is the triathlon athlete. <laughs> she, she is triathlon athlete. I was one running with her and I'm nothing. <laughs> yeah, Imam started with me and then after one kilometer. Okay, guys, we just go, please. <laughs> All right, so um, welcome again. And my name is Katria Varma, but because we are all friends, you can call me Kaisu. And currently I'm working at Swinburne University of Technology and Akbar Ramdani, professor, is my line manager. And he's also the leader of fluid and process dynamics group that I'm working. And we will start with the same way as the other lectures. So I will be introducing our university and telling some background of myself. And then Akbar will go to the hard topic and give you some more detailed lecture of uh, steel making with hydrogen. So Australia. And yeah, as a background, I'm actually from Finland. So I did my PhD at Aalto University, so I know this previous professors guide wo quite well, but yeah, I moved all the way to the other side of the planet, to Australia, two and a half years ago. And so our university is located in Melbourne, in Victoria, which is here on the south part of Australia. 
So it's rather far from here, but definitely more close <laughs> to, to, to Indonesia than Finland is. But yeah, so our main campus is located in the city, uh, like some 10 kilometers uh, from the city center of Melbourne. We have very good pu public transportation options to get there. Um, our campus, it's quite compact, but there are a lot of different topics and groups you can do studying and research. It's quite nice in architecture and actually our offices are located in ATC building, which is this one here. And in general, it's very cozy environment in the, crew, uh, in the whole campus area. <coughs> so like Swinburne University of Technology, it's very research intensive and oriented university. We are trying to focus on delivering research that will create economic and social impact and value. Uh, it was founded in 1908 uh, by George Winburn and it attained university status in 1992. And as told previously, our main campus is in Hawthorne, which is rather close to Melbourne uh, city. But we have another two campuses in metropolitan area located in Wantirna and Croydon. We have additional campuses. One is in Sydney and then overseas, uh, three of them, Malay in one in Malaysia and two in, in Vietnam. So here are some of the research strengths and topics you can study at Swinburne. So there's all the way from data si science for health innovations and renewable energy, space technology, and our focus is here on the engineering department and in materials and metallurgical mechanics. Uh, yeah, and there's different topics you can also study in engineering department uh, as, as metallurgy. So our flight fluid and process dynamics group, FPD, uh, its general overview is in high temperature experimentation and modeling. We do kinetics, thermodynamic modeling, process modeling. There's also some soft tensor techno-economic analysis completed. And we have also fluid dynamic group, uh, which is more focused on uh, fluid dynamics, also doing experimentation and yeah, CFD. Uh, we have approximately 35 PhD students currently, and then there are eight of us research fellows. We have a lot of collaboration with different industrial partners, such as Umicor, Calix, Metzol, Tata Steel, and so on. And yeah, there are a lot of projects going on with industry, which is very important to get like also the industry to, to collaborate with universities so we can do even better research. So we also uh, provide some uh, short workshops or trainings around the world uh, when requested and needed. So uh, in our group, we have pretty much like three labor laboratory spaces. Uh, I'm especially working in Robert Simpson High Temperature Laboratory. We have different furnaces there and also DTA mass spectrometer. We have high temperature optical microscope and we used to have the cold modeling laboratory there, but it was relocated, but it's still there. And there are a lot of studies uh, work uh, doing something related to that. We have some resource efficiency studio, which includes pre-processing equipment and some characterization equipment. And then we have this energy transformation, transformation laboratory that includes solar simulating simulator with uh, collaboration into furnace so we can kind of mimic how solar energy could be used in furnaces and to uh, process materials. We have also, there is also a wave simulator and wave bond in the same uh, space. So we have two professors in pyrometallurgy, uh, Professor Akbar who's here and also we have other professor Jeffrey Brooks uh, related to iron and steel making especially, and also astro and solar, solar metallurgy. Akbar can tell, then tell more about himself. Uh, we have also three professors related to fluid dynamics. Uh, and 
yeah, they're also very active in the group. And then we have seven other professors who are supporting the, the group and the other, yeah, kind of giving their expertise in the uh, pro projects needed. And then there are eight of us research fellows and yeah, <laughs> here I am and here's other ones. Uh, yes, so the group has received quite nice amount of uh, awards during the past 10 years and especially already t this year uh, Jeffrey Brooks uh, received this Bessemer gold medal which is quite big honor and also uh, Akbar got some sustainable metallurgy award. Uh, here are all the PhD students currently working uh, in our group and the red ones highlighted are actually the Indonesian ones. So we have a lot of Indonesian students currently uh, in the group. In general, we have very international group. There are people from UK, from uh, Sri Lanka, from Netherlands, from Iran, from China, and so on. So everybody is welcome and we want to increase the whole group in general. Uh, here are the main research directions currently we have in the group. So there are especially topics related to metals recycling and secondary resources. And then decarbonization of metallurgical processes, sustainable materials and minerals processes are uh, under interest. We have uh, topics about the critical metals and minerals processing as well as about solar, me solar metallurgy and astrometallurgy. Then I want to just one slide about my own research. So currently I'm working in pro uh, in project that is investigating silicon refining. And this is kind of a new technology we try to develop and create. So the aim is to develop this novel cutting edge technology to produce solar grade silicon from silicon scraps using electrochemical cells at high temperatures. So we, we want to see how adoption of electricity will influence the behavior of certain elements. Could we actually enhance the removal of boron and phosphorus from silicon, which are actually very difficult elements to remove in below like sub PPEM level. So could this be one technology we could use for that? And at the same time, solar panels include silver. So could we recover silver into silicon with this technology? And the whole idea bases on the fact that the reactions between metal and slag, they are electrochemical in nature. And the slag is, has like, it is an ionic uh, melt. So it will have ions that will be moving there. So kind of the whole idea is to, we want to know how much electricity applied uh, can drive these certain reactions further and enhance the kinetics. Uh, we have had some studies before done on this topic. Some 2015 was one PhD uh, work done at Swinburne related to this, this. but there are also other studies uh, kind of similar that has been done in iron and steel making. And these have been investigating decarbonization, deoxidation and, and also the sulfurization of irons and steel using this kind of electrochemical cell design. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and yeah, in general, it's kind of in three phases, the whole project. So we have been investigating the distribution of these elements without any electricity applied kind of to set the basis for the system and see how actually then the electricity will influence it. So my presentation tomorrow will be about these equilibrium uh, studies and on the distribution coefficients for boron and phosphorus between silicon and slag. And then we have a PhD student. Uh, he's also from Indonesia and he's investigating the kinetics of this system and he's completing experiments with this setup but in like small lab, lab scale whereas I have been designing and building this pilot scale reactor for it 
it will be half, half kilo to one kilo that we can melt and then test the theory and test how this setup will work. And then in the end, I just want to uh, explain and show some figures from my experiences in Australia. It's been actually very nice two and a half years. Okay, the first half year I was actually, uh, it was like during the lockdown time, so I couldn't pretty much go anywhere, even into the lab. But yeah, since everything opened, it's been awesome. And I've been trying to travel and experience as much as possible. So I was actually in hot balloon flight over the city. Melbourne is actually the, the biggest city you can pass over or go above uh, in the world. So if you want to have flight, like hot balloon flight over some city, Melbourne will be the one. <laughs> and this figure is actually from, from Albert Park, where they organize or they arrange Formula One ra race. And also I was seeing the Australian Open. There's a lot of cultural things you can go and enjoy. There's some figures from our lab and also from the research group. We often organize some birthday cake if someone has birthday. And also Jeff, our professor, had birthday, so we also organized cake for him. And then somewhat more, I love outdoors. So there's so much to see in Australia, especially like if you like outdoors. You can see also a lot of animals if you go camping pretty much anywhere. You can see wallabies, kangaroos, emus, opossums, wallab yeah, like different birds and everything. So it's been great. You can also go skiing during certain time of the year. We also visited with my mom. We went to Sydney and yeah, it's been, it's been nice two and a half years, so I welcome everybody to Australia, and we have m space for more Indonesian students there. Mm. Thank you very much. Terima oh. <laughs> And please, Professor Anwar. Now is the, the most interesting part. Yes. <laughs> uh, hopefully I can do the justice, but... <laughs> so, um, good afternoon, everyone. Wake up. <laughs> <laughs> so it's always very uh, nice uh, to come back to um, to your alma mater, right? So I actually um, graduated from ITB um, from materials engineering, but my final year uh, undergrad project is actually with, with metallurgy. So if you know Pak Shoni, who's now already uh, retired, I believe. So we, I did my final year project with him. So I have also quite strong uh, ties with the uh, metallurgical department. Um, so I'm going to talk about a uh, topic that um, um, I believe Pak Zul really loves and also that is quite important these days, yeah? Because uh, as I will be explaining soon why this is important. Um, uh, just also a bit about myself. After I finished my um, bachelor degree, I went to study in Canada, McMaster University, um, and so that's where I uh, get my PhD. And then um, after I finished my PhD, then I moved to uh, Brisbane, University of Queensland, where I did my postdoctoral research and for about two years, and I moved to Swinburne since then. So that's January 2008, so it's been a while. And also during my um, time in, Swin uh, sorry, in, 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 in UQ in Brisbane, I also uh, uh, interacted with uh, pa Patofik. So Patofik is actually uh, my former master's student over there. So, and also he's quite a, uh, a very, very bright uh, researcher. Yeah? Um, right, so I'm going to talk about the carbonization of iron and steel making towards zero carbon emission. Okay, let's see if I can. Right, so this topic is coming from uh, two of our recent papers. So if you would like to know more, you can actually get to this um, uh, two papers, which is just published this year as well. So one is in Journal of Clean Production, which is talk about the carbonization and hydrogen investigation, integration uh, of steel industries. And the other one is uh, looking at, in more specific, on the hydrogen itself, yeah? So the economics of making the hydrogen, right? Now you will see later on why that is interconnected. Right, okay. 
Now I'm I'm a bit sad that the, the one of the uh, <laughs> the photo oh. uh, Yun Bei actually beat me to it, <laughs> but anyway, so this is actually ten years ago in the in this very room, and uh, of course I was with uh, Yun Bei, Professor uh, uh, Azul, and Jeff Brooks, and also Pak Sunara as well, which also um, I don't know if you have a a chance to meet with him, but uh, he's also a, a very um, dear to me, so he's my teacher as well. So, so yeah, so uh, this is about 10 years ago, so it's been a while. Okay, so why about this decarbonization? So I want to start with something that is quite simple. So decarbonization, basically want to remove c uh, carbon, right? So it's all about removing CO2. So this uh, can be in a number of ways, of course. Um, from the perspective of Australia, and I believe also Indonesia, we want to uh, eliminate the greenhouse emissions by 43%. So that's quite a lot, right? And, um, and of course, we want to contribute to, to, uh, you know, um, to this you know, in, in, a, in a global effort, right? And I want, I'm also sure that Indonesia also will be playing a vital role here. So uh, yeah, the common is basically you want to eliminate direct emissions, right? And uh, there are a number of ways you can do that. You can use a um, renewable power, right? So, um, uh, or you can use, uh, you can capture the carbon and then you put it underground, for example. Uh, and you can also use hydrogen, right? Um, and in general, you can also electrify your, your process, right? Of course, when you do that, you want to make sure that the source of electricity coming from renewable sources as well, such as you know through hydrogen, solar energy, wind, wind energy, and so on, right? So that's uh, the carbonization in general, and uh, we want to increase this more and more. Okay, so I remember about that 43 percent. So from a certain perspective, so that's that's quite big. So for us to do that, we we go to the bigger, the biggest problem, right? Um, and uh, or the, the the white elephant in the room, the big elephant in the room, right? So one of those is actually these heavy industries. Um, that um, can be, you know, iron and steel making industries, cement industries, uh, aluminium, alumina and aluminium industries, right? Uh, and also petrochemical industries. And this, um, from these industries, it it was estimated. Um, it's uh, contributing to about 12.6 gigatons of um, of CO2, right? And uh, and of course one of them is iron and steel, which take about 24% of those uh, CO2 emission from these whole industries. Uh, specific to steel and iron and steel industries, it's uh, uh, it's estimated about uh, seven to nine percent of global emission coming from iron and steel. Um, and it's uh, using about 8% of energy. So uh, this is one of the big, the big uh, elephant. Right? Um, if, if we can see also the breakdown of the steel production by country, and most of them is coming from China, right? 56.7% um, from Japan, India, um, and Europe, and so on, right? So of course, if all of the efforts is done outside China, then it's, it's also a, a small sort of effect. Yeah? So in a way, we also need to, 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 to encourage China as well to, to, uh, to do the, uh, uh, to, to uh, co uh, contribute to this effort, basically. Uh, Australia, it's quite small. It's uh, ranked 29, uh, it's only 55, 5.5 million ton per year, which is quite small. Uh, right, okay, so that's the general aspect. So how can we, or what is in general way we can do decarbonization in iron and steel making? So to do that, we can look at the, the typical routes to make iron and steel. Yeah? So this, uh, this um, image summarizes that one. So there is one uh, called the integrated route, where you, um, you use coke and coal and then uh, you use uh, fine ore and you make a sinter or pellets and we put that uh, in blast furnace. So that's the iron making uh, bit. 
and then after we process them, get uh, pig iron, we refine them in the steel making process in blast, uh, the basic oxygen furnace, right? And in that situation, and in that, in that sort of uh, process, you can add scrap, and, and then you refine by blowing oxygen and to get, uh, um, to get steel, basically. There's also um, smelting reduction, right? In this case, you are mixing uh, ore or fine, fine ore. You can make pellets um, and you can reduce it in the shaft furnace, uh, that pellets, right? Or you can use, uh, or you can just uh, 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 re uh, di reduce directly that fine yeah, in a uh, free dice bed type reactor, right? Um, using, uh, using reducing conditions. So it could be methane, uh, it could be uh, um, um, hydrogen, right? And after that, in this case, you, um, you melt them and you get um, like uh, uh, an iron, uh, which you can also further refine in BOF. Um, and there's another route, the direct reduction, where you reduce them uh, similarly in, in the shaft furnace or free dust bed. Um, and in this case, you not go into a liquid state, right? It's just um, a solid state. Um, you can then form uh, the RI, HPI, which for the process in the EF, right? In, in all of this, you can also add scrap to it or 100% scrap, right? Scrap melting in the EF. So these are the common route to uh, make iron and steel. And, and we can look at this, okay, where, where we can actually make the difference in terms of decarbonization, yeah? So we're going to look at that one by one. Um, yeah, so of course why the iron and steel making industries have quite large CO2 emissions is because we use coke, we use coal and uh, as a reductant source of fuel, right? Okay, um, just to give you some ideas, um, the pr proportion of the production of steel and the typical um, CO2 emission from, from, from these different routes, for example here, about 73% of steel is produced by the blast furnace BOF, the integrated route. And uh, the remaining is 26.3 electric arc furnace and small amount is in other, um, other sort of route, right? And you can see from here the different uh, carbon emission for different routes. Um, BF, uh, BOF is about two ton CO2 per ton of iron. If it's just remelting, uh, scrap remelting in EF, it's 0 0.4 ton CO2 per, per, per ton of uh, iron. Um, and you probably wondering, EF is electric arc furnace using electricity, yeah? But why you still have this CO2? So we'll see that also in a bit. Um, right, so in general, the, the way that we can uh, improve um, or, or, or you know, uh, promote decarbonization in iron and steel can be through this uh, uh, number of things. We can substitute coal and coke with biomass um, or uh, using hydrogen, right? Or if we still on the, you know, in the, in the middle sort of, uh, uh, you know, it's in transition period, so we can, we can also potentially capture um, uh, utilize or store the, uh, the CO2. So that's, if you uh, hear CCUS, so that's what it means, carbon capture, utilization, and storage. Uh, we can use uh, more electri uh, electrification, right? Uh, increase uh, steel recycling, right? Uh, and or in general, improving the efficiency or even starting a new way of making iron and steel. So new clean, technologies for iron and steel productions. Um, more systematically, the way that we can do is shown in this next few slides. So for example here, um, uh, hydrogen and hydrogenation route. One, we can increase scrap recycling. So this is where if we uh, want to increase the uh, use of electric arc furnace as the main way to make steel. Right? Um, we introduce hydrogen in blast furnace, right? 
Um, so uh, it's still the integrated route, but we introduce hydrogen to it, right? Um, we um, use hydrogen to make the RI. Remember the process in the middle there, which is there is a smelting and also that it reduce iron, yeah? So in that situation, we use hydrogen as a reductor, uh, which can be processed in a shell furnace or free dice bed. Then further, we process that in EF, and, and on the top here, BOF, and that one's also EF. And in all of this, we can also have scrap input it into BOF and also electric arc furnace. Right. Um, seems easy, yeah? But we'll see some of the problems and, and, and the dilemma later on. Another one, okay. So when you have a uh, materials that is not that good, low-grade iron, right? Low-grade iron ores, sometimes you need to have another process after your reduction, right? So, uh, so we can have another furnace in between, such as smelter, or we call it smelting furnace, or submerged arc furnace, or uh, open slag bath furnace, yeah? So basically for us to remove the gang before it's processed further in, in the BOF. Um, also we can um, implement the CCUS. Yep. Now the technology is there. So, but I think it's still quite ex expensive, yeah. Um, or the last one is new approaches in iron and steel making. So we're going to look at some of this one by one and see what are the problems and also dilemma on, on taking one of these route, yeah? The first one is recycling more and more. So we increase this re recycling through in EF, yeah? So we process more scraps. Um, like I said, electric arc furnace is, you know, you can, you can see from the uh, roads there, electric, right? But it is not actually coming 100% electric. I will see in a bit. Um, so this one is actually done um, in, in uh, well, the use of EAFs uh, was uh, uh, you know, big, actually, in the U.S. Uh, actually, the production of steel in the U.S., about 70% is coming through this route, yeah, recycling. Um, and in this case, of course, if you want to go through this one, you, make, you want to make sure that the electricity is coming from renewable sources, so there, there will be a shift from uh, the regular energy from coal, for example, into uh, renewable energy. Right? Um, and currently, uh, natural gas also being used, but in the end, we, we want to have this um, also, also um, phase out so that also hydrogen can go into, into the process more and more. Uh, so this is where we can make that um, uh, you know, improvement in terms of the process route. One is the electric arc furnace itself, yeah? So we add more scrap to it. Right? Um, or in the reheat furnace, so they usually use a, um, a natural gas, but we can, we can add hydrogen to it. Right? And um, the one on the right-hand side here is showing the, uh, uh, the typical energy required per, per tons of billet uh, using a different types of uh, fuel um, and so on. So, um, and um, yeah, so just quite interesting here. Now, um, so depending on the route, uh, we can have different types, so different amount of uh, CO2 per ton of steel. And uh, this is just a comparison of them. If we uh, have scrap uh, an EAF route, that's about uh, less than 400 kilogram of CO2 per ton of steel. Uh, of course, the BF, BOF is quite big, right? If we use natural gas in there, uh, it started to go down. And if you um, also uh, using uh, hydrogen, for example, then it also started to go down as well. And there's one in here, which is also from hybrid, which is uh, quite low uh, CO2 um, uh, emission per ton of steel. Now, so what's the problem with, with scrap? Well, um, the, uh, it's availability, right? So um, there are not many scrap available, actually. 
and it's quite an expensive commodity as well. So for example, in Australia, this is quite interesting. There's, uh, there's some scraps and we have a steel company that is basically the electric arc furnace route, right? But they actually sell the scrap elsewhere because it's more profitable to sell scraps to Indonesia, for example. So there's, a, there's an economic aspect to it as well, which you need to, to look at. Um, so this is just showing uh, the, um, the different types of scrap availability over the years. Um, and there's an obsolete scrap there, uh, home scrap from steel making, prompt scrap, home scrap foundry, and so on. So uh, this is, um, uh, of course, there's an uh, increasing amount, but still that, that, that amount is not enough to supply uh, everything if you want to you know, make steel 100% um, from, from, from this route. Yeah, it's just not possible. Now, this is the thing that I want to mention earlier. So talking about EAF, um, uh, the electrical energy um, input is actually only 56%. So you still use carbon to oxidize, that contribute to about 23% of energy. You also use natural gas, a burner, to keep the heat or to make sure that the heat is actually quite uniform. That's 5%, uh, and there's also some oxidation in, in metals, 8%, uh, and so on. Right. So it is actually not 100% electrical energy. You still have uh, carbon in there as well which give us a bit of CO2 emission from the process. Let's wait a bit. I hope it wasn't because of me. <laughs> Okay. I just because of my foot, I'm sorry. I'll hit the button. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want you you, you want me to stop talking, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, right. So, uh, the other thing that is, um, um, you know, the, uh, quite give a dilemma is uh, about the uh, the um, the tramp elements or the residuals in in the scrap. Yeah. So you have some elements that very difficult to remove, such as copper. Thin, right? And you know, Professor Yun Bei Kang is actually w uh, working on that area as well, to try to remove tin and, and copper. It's very difficult. So if you have these elements, um, the scrap is actually, with time, it will build up, right? And um, it's very difficult to remove. And the one of the way to, to remove is basically you have to dilute it. So you have to add sort of fresh new steel there to uh, reduce the uh, concentration. There. Um, of course, if you want to uh, process through EF, you want to have free renewable energy ready uh, nearby, so for the electricity. And uh, there's still a lot of uh, blast furnace uh, BOF plants around the world, so to replace that one, it's, it can be quite a uh, you know, dilemmatic sort of uh, uh, situation there. So there's a political and economic repercussion as well. Um, Right, so that's the first one, first route. Now the second route is uh, introducing hydrogen into the blast furnace. Right. Uh, it looks like easy, just saying that, but it's actually not. So you can see from here, um, that's the blast furnace here and the uh, emission of uh, CO2. And ideally, of course, um, if you reduce the use of, of carbon in there, um, you, can, you can also reduce the CO2 by incorporating hydrogen into it. Um, but as you understand the, uh, the mechanism of, of, of blast furnace, uh, how the reactor is working, right? So you need to have this uh, quite a good structure inside the, inside, the, inside the reactor, right? So, you know, replacing coke with something else is, is not easy, right? So I don't, I don't think we can use everything with hydrogen, right? And the use of biomass as well, you know, the, uh, the uh, yeah, of course, the, the, the strength is not that, that good compared to coke. Yeah? So there's a limit we can replace coke in the blast furnace. Um, right, so, so that's one of the uh, challenge there. Of course, if you want to use more hydrogen in blast furnace or in, in, in general in, in, in iron and steel making, 
then you will need to consider about uh, the parts to making that hydrogen, right? So you know there's a uh, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, uh, different types of colors of hydrogen, right? Um, and, uh, and, and of course we want to have a green hydrogen, renewable hydrogen, where you generate the hydrogen from uh, renewable uh, energy, right? Uh, but that's also not, not easy as well. Uh, different countries will have a different sort of uh, potential. Um, so the hydrogen, uh, you use that energy and then you can, um, you can split water, for example, to make uh, hydrogen, right? And uh, there are two general process that uh, are commercially uh, available through the alkaline electrolysis right? and through uh, the uh, proton exchange membrane process there. Um, and so you can make hydrogen. You know. But the problem is the scale. Right? So um, this one is from early kid. And the, the most recent sort of plant is about, let's say, five times four. So it's about 20 megawatt of uh, plant to produce hydrogen, right? But you can actually do a calculation uh, how much um, hydrogen needed for, for making steel uh, via, let's say, via the uh, blast furnace uh, BOF, right? And if you do that, roughly um, about 104 kilogram hydrogen per ton of steel is needed. And um, and um, for uh, for one million for for, ma oh, for one million ton uh, per year steel, you will need about 12 ton hydrogen per hour, right? So you can calculate again um, the amount of uh, you know plant or fertilizer plant that you need. Uh, let's assume about 70 percent efficiency, so you will need about 600 megawatt of electrolyzer. Uh, compared to recently that I just showed about 20, right? So it is, it's, there's still a gap there uh, to, to provide that hydrogen for the process. Um, okay, having said that, of course, uh, uh, companies around the world are also trying to use that. Uh, for example, uh, Tyson Krupp um, uh, trials uh, the use of uh, bl hydrogen in blast furnace and basically uh, it is uh, put through the uh, two years to replace the PCI, the full price coal injection, right? And so it's not really, you know, uh, well, it's yeah, reducing a lot of the coke inside, but um, in a way, it's uh, increasing the amount of hydrogen. And it's, it's, it's working, but there's also some technical aspect that needs to be considered as well. There's a limit where how much you can uh, put hydrogen uh, and mix with PCI so that the processes actually uh, work. Yeah. So, um, okay. Right, the other route. Right. Uh, number three is uh, the use of hydrogen to make DRI followed by electric arc furnace. Um, so in this situation, well, the, the RF process actually, you know, it's uh, commercialized. So people use this and uh, people use uh, um, um, uh, natural gas to reduce, which is already good, right? But um, we want to uh, use more and more hydrogen in this, in this sort of process. Right? Um, so for example, here, there's a one uh, proof of commercial scale, uh, which using fluid as bed, which is circa red. Um, and it was trialed, in, or it was actually done in 1990s in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so they make, they made steel using hydrogen as a reductant. Um, also, this, uh, these days also there's a midrex sort of process and HYL process, and they use more and more hydrogen in the process. Right? Um, the problem is um, hydrogen reduction is endothermic. So you have to, to think about the heat balance and how you're going to um, uh, keep, the, you know, keep the heat at, at that particular temperature. Because when you have reaction, if the temperature goes down, you can have reversion, right? Because thermodynamically is quite weak, the hydrogen reduction. So you can actually um, uh, have, have the oxide back. Um, right. The other process I mentioned earlier is um, the existing DRI processes operate on rich iron feeds, um, which has about iron 
larger than 65%. So if you have low-grade ores, which you know, exists in large quantity around the world, then uh, you have to think about how you, you need to, to remove the gang. So, uh, so that can become a problem, and, and there are ways to do that, but uh, of course um, it adds to the uh, complexity of the process. Uh, to give you some ideas about the DRI production around the world, in 2020, um, the DRI uh, uh, production, about 60% coming from Midrex, uh, and 24% from Rotary Kiln, 12% from HYL, and also the rest is uh, from other sort of um, um, uh, processes there. Um, right, and as you can see, the amount of DRI is increasing with time uh, slightly, um, and and it's predicted also to to also keep increasing as well if we want to uh, use that this route of of, of hydrogen um, for making iron and steel. This is a uh, uh, a, um, a, a flow sheet process flow sheet for the steel core process um, uh, that was done before to make uh, um, you know uh, iron using hydrogen, so using a fluidized bed uh, followed by EAF, right? Um, uh, also the hy hybrid process here, um, using uh, like a, a shaft furnace with a pallet um, to reduce uh, uh, using hydrogen. So this one is a collaboration between S SAB, um, LKAB, and Fat and Fall. Um, and it's progressing quite quite well as well. It's uh, it's a big project there in, in Sweden. Um, also ArcelorMittal, for example, um, they have this uh, um, the DRI demonstration plan with 100% hydrogen, right? Um, so uh, the hydrogen that is used is coming from natural gas, uh, no carbon capture, and and then then the process goes into EF to make the steel. Um, so there are also other things that you want to consider when you want to mix um, um, the RI with, with scrap as well, right? So um, because you can actually use the, the RI uh, and scrap together in, in, in electric aquifers, right? Um, and this is uh, the associated CO2 emission. If you have more scrap, 100% scrap, of course, it's quite small. And in between, you have this uh, uh, combination between uh, yeah, in between the ore and, and scrap base here, um, and that's the uh, uh, the typical process in each of the country uses the this combination or the the, the mixture of this uh, uh, scrap and, and ore. Okay. Uh, things to consider, like I already mentioned, um, one is do we need some um, post melting technology, right, to remove the gang. And um, and um, yeah, I mentioned about current shaft technology based around rich ore feeds, um, and also mentioned about the endothermic reaction there. So and in fact, some of the uh, trials uh, suggested not not 100% hydrogen; it's about 80, 35% hydrogen, right? Uh, through this uh, uh, and so on. Yeah. Right. The last one is, uh, okay, we, we just start over and use different types of uh, new technologies to make iron and steel, right? So there are a number of uh, routes proposed or, or research, yeah? One is using hydrogen plasma smelting reductor, right? So in this case, you, you make the hydrogen from electrolyzer and uh, you, uh, you, you, you basically generate hydrogen plasma using plasma torch. Uh, which can be used um, as a, as a heat, as a melter, right? But also as a as a reductor as well, because it's uh, um, using hydrogen there, and uh, and you make the uh, the iron and also slag uh, in this uh, reactor there. Um, so in this situation, of course, you can reduce the CO2 uh, emission quite significantly, right? Uh, Ninety-five percent compared to BF BOF route. Um, but it's still low the RL, um, and it's uh, it's still still basically uh, under research. Yeah. You can have alkaline uh, iron electrolysis, right? So um, 
you, you leach out uh, the iron, for example, from ore, yeah? and then um, you pass through that to an electrochemical cell to, um, uh, to basically uh, make uh, or deposit iron or make iron and you melt that in, in the next stage, which is in electric arc furnace and so on. And this one is also uh, uh, low TRL as well. Um, and it will also depend on impurities of the iron ore and um, you know, um, current density, types of electrolytes and their concentration. Uh, but it also potentially can reduce the CO2 by 85 to 95%. Uh, molten oxide electrolysis. Right. So in this case, um, you are not um, leaching the iron first. You actually melt the ore yeah, into uh, into a liquid uh, oxide, and then you use electro uh, chemistry to or electrolysis cell to basically uh, reduce and get the iron or steel from 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 that from that reactor. Um, uh, in this situation, potentially, of course, the CO2 can be reduced by 100% if you use the CO or the, car or the electricity from renewable energy sources. Um, it's still also very low TRL um, and TRL even lower than before, uh, uh, previous examples, and a slow process, a huge number of cells with significant capital investment if you want to keep the same sort of capacity. <laughs> total capacity. Um, yeah, so uh, also still under research as well. Uh, this is also another technology. Um, um, this is from Australia, Calix Zesty, zero, zero emission steel making technology. So our group has been working with, with, with them to try to investigate the uh, hydrogen reduction. So this one here is like a flash uh, reduction type right, reactor. But you see, of course, it's different than uh, when you um, you know, flash reacting uh, sulfide, right? Because basically it's not autogenous. So in this case, um, the heat is provided. So the reactor is actually a column, right? And you pass through the iron fines from the top and the heater or the heating is from the side using electric heating, right? So potentially, and also from the bottom, you pass through hydrogen, right? So potentially if you use the hydrogen production using renewable energy, and also the electricity coming from uh, renewable energy as well, potentially can, uh, can uh, uh, you know, it's 100% carbon free. Um, another one, trying to use solar metallurgy to reduce the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the carbon coming from, from heating uh, of, of the furnace. So in this case, we are using uh, concentrated solar energy to supply heat requirements for the process and um, just to let you know, if you, if you de design really well, you can actually get, can get about 2,000 degrees Celsius if you concentrate it sun's energy into, a, into a, an area, right? So it's enough to melt uh, minerals. So the idea here is you do a beneficiation and make a pellet, a composite pellet, and then you use a solar smelting uh, where the heat and electricity coming from solar and you get iron nugget from this. So, um, so we've been also uh, doing research in this area, and uh, you can also look at from from that sort of uh, paper there. Uh, that's that's the idea here, um, using a rotary hybrid furnace, uh, and so on. So, to summarize, <laughs> a number of approaches can be implemented in iron and steel making uh, for for you know for the effort of the carbonization. Um, starting from transitioning stage into a fully uh, decarbonized process. Of course, there are still a lot of challenges from technical and not non-technical, right? Um, and it may also be that, you know, we need to develop a new technology, right? Um, so I just want to mention, basically, it is a good time for, for, for you, for us, <coughs> as a metallurgy uh, students, yeah? Because you will be play a vital role uh, in many of, of the efforts, including decarbonization, you know, recycling, so, uh, and so on. So, so it is a good time, yeah? So we need you, right? And, and in fact, I have this one. So if you want to do PhD, and these are some of the topics that 
I have in the next two years, right? So send me your CV and, um, and we can discuss uh, you coming to Swinburne. So thank you. Okay, yeah, hang on. <laughs> 10 years ago, when Professor Akbar came here, there is a lady very active and she sent CV to Akbar and she graduated with Prof Akbar and then he worked in there also. Uh, Her yes. name is Epma. She's now in Blue Scope. Oh, so okay. And she's done very well. Yes. And she, I think, uh, she also have Australian husband. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, who knows? Australian wife, Australian husband, who knows, okay? <laughs> okay, guys, question please. Who? One, two, but maybe one. We have still a lot of time tomorrow. During two days, you will see all professor in Aula. So you can sneak in and chit chat with them and asking something, okay? And Please. And of course, you can also send emails. Well yes, there. you can always send email to them, okay? Okay. Please mention your name and maybe your year, your, yes? Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I would like to in introduce myself. Uh, my name is Beha Yakim. Uh, I am a final year metallurgical engineering student, and I am interested in uh, hydrogen for steel making, especially hydrogen plasma, and. Uh, have you ever conduct an experiment or a pilot project for uh, that? And from your opinion, is that feasible or not in industry? Yes, that's my question. Thank you. Uh, the answer is no, not yet. <laughs> 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 but um, but we are about to start to do that. So um, uh, actually, now I have uh, two students. Um, one is from from metallurgical department who's going to look at. Um, plasma reduction of silica to make silicon, and um, also a, a, a reduction of copper oxide using plasma reduction. Mm -hmm. So uh, now we actually also doing a techno-economic analysis study on the use of plasma for, for, uh, for iron and steel making. And, um, and uh, to be honest, <laughs> the indication at the moment yeah, is still not good, right? Uh, but you know, I always make it you know open-minded, and also um, you know one of the one of the um, strong thing about plasma hydrogen is you know it's it can reduce all of oxides, even though the one that is in the bottom alumina, magnesia, and rare earth, right? So that's why oh sorry, <laughs> there's one topic there about uh, making of uh, a reduction of rare earth oxide using plasma, right? So it's still uh, so the, the plasma technology is uh, is uh, used in a different way at the moment, you know, for, for plas pl uh, uh, plasma spray, thermal plasma spray, and so on. But uh, in 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 for iron and making steel making, it's still under research. Yeah. But I'm quite hopeful. <laughs> Thank you, Akbar. Actually, Akbar is not only open-minded; he's very very uh, out of the box. He already published a paper how to extract metal from the moon, but that is uh, from 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 Mars. <laughs> from Mars, yes. Okay, give applause. Okay, uh, save the best for the last. <laughs> There's always like yeah. Okay, Professor David from Canada, please welcome. I hope you are still wake up. Okay, please do stretching a little bit. <laughs> okay, please. Okay, thank you. I'll just get this straight. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm definitely the last, <laughs> I think, before dinner time. Is that right? <laughs> One more meal. <laughs> um, my name is David Dreisinger from the University of British Columbia from Vancouver, Canada. So I checked my watch before I stood up to give the talk, and it's about uh, 3 o'clock in the morning for me. So if I seem a little tired, that's why. <laughs> I just arrived yesterday to Bandung. 
we have a number of students from Indonesia that are studying at the University of British Columbia. Reza, who's in the front row, is doing his PhD. Just wave your hand, Reza, so you can make connection with Reza. And uh, another student, Ronnie Winarko, uh, came a few years ago and also finished his PhD and is now doing a postdoctoral fellowship at the university. So we're very happy to have a connection with uh, ITB Bandung and look forward to meeting many of you in the next couple of days as well. So first, a few words about the University of British Columbia and then some talk, talk about some of the research and areas of interest for us. Oops, what have I done wrong? Can you put that up again? Okay, this one, okay. Okay, uh, too small, unfortunately, but I'll just po point out a couple of uh, items to you. <coughs> so we have about 60 some thousand students at the University of British Columbia. And the number right here, which is a little hard to see, is close to 30% of our students at our Vancouver campus are actually international students. So we're, we're very much an international uh, campus, a university. Yeah, total students about 70,000. Total faculty and staff about 19,000. And two separate campuses, one in Vancouver and one in central British Columbia. So we do a lot of research. Our budget for research in a year is about three quarters of a billion dollars. And we have about 375,000 alumni from all over the world, 160 countries represented. My field is hydrometallurgy, and every, ever since I've been a professor at the university, there's been something called the Industrial Research Chair in Hydrometallurgy, which shows that we have one foot in academia, one foot in industry. We try to re apply real world solutions to uh, real world problems using hydrometallurgical technology. The history of hydrometallurgy at UBC is very long. We have a professor, Frank Forward, who was one of the pioneers in hydrometallurgy. He developed a lot of pressure leaching technology, including the pressure leaching technologies applied by the Sherritt Company in Canada and in Australia. And my mentor was Professor Ernie Peters, who was one of the great theoreticians in hydrometallurgy, developing uh, things like EHPH diagrams, and a lot of the very fundamentals of hydrometallurgy. Since 1988, which was around the time Professor Peters retired, uh, we started this share in hydrometallurgy. We currently have about 18 sponsors and new sponsors are, are w welcome to join. These are some of the companies that we're currently working with. You can recognize some of the large com uh, com companies from around the world. The Glencore Company, <coughs> Rio Tinto, uh, BSF from Germany, and so on. So these are some of the sponsors of the work that we do at the university. What do we try to do in the chair? We try to do a lot of research. So Reza is studying the fundamentals of uh, copper leaching using iodine as a catalyst. We do try to develop processes. We'll talk about some process developments in a minute. We have both undergraduates and graduates involved, of course. And we spend a lot of time working with industry, visiting with industry, teaching courses, and working at technology transfer. Um, I want to talk today in terms of the research topic on the use of pressure hydrometallurgy as a, a technology for meeting uh, global needs for decarbonization and sustainable materials production. UBC is one of the founding uh, centers, if you will, on pressure leaching or pressure hydrometallurgy. This is a technology that's taking off in Indonesia. You're now one of the world centers for HPAL, high pressure acid leaching of nickel, and probably have many more applications in the future. So I thought I would try to talk about this in the, in the light of decarbonization and sustainable materials production. So August 2023 was when I prepared this slide. What's happening on Spaceship Earth? Well, we see atmospheric CO2 continues to increase. The trend is quite uh, uh, um, consistent. You, you should say this is from the uh, National Ocean Administration in the United States. So we're currently sitting a little bit above 400 ppm of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, the annual CO2 emissions, everybody talks about net zero. Do you see net zero there? <laughs> we're, we're a long way from net zero, right? We, we're putting about 40 gigatons of CO2 into the atmosphere every year. And everybody talks about decarbonizing, but we're not doing a very good job if this is a report card, right? So we have a lot, of, a lot long way to go. 
and, uh, and the problem is getting worse. We're putting more CO2 rather than less year by year with maybe a small blip due to COVID. Um, in terms of world electricity production by source, you can see that um, coal is still the major uh, producer of electricity, along with gas, still some oil. Nuclear has been roughly consistent over the years, um, <coughs> with a little, little bit of dip again due to recent events. But now we're seeing increasing amounts of hydropower, uh, solar, wind, and other renewables. So this is the hopeful part of our, our future in terms of looking for non-carbon uh, forms of electricity. What's happening with uh, uh, electric vehicles and transportation? Well, the demand for lithium is increasing tremendously. We can see that uh, this is the, the actual statistics, and these are some of the projections. But as the number of electric, electric vehicles increases, we're going to need more and more of lithium as a critical material. Of course, we're also going to need a lot more nickel, and that's where Indonesia comes in. So the world now, this is a, a slide from 2021, the world consumes about uh, 2.5 million tons per year of nickel th that year. But by 2050, we need about 9.2 million tons per year. That's an amazing amount of nickel. One HPAL produces maybe 60,000 tons of nickel. So if we want to increase from 2.5 to 9.2, we're going to need tens of HPALs being built. And where's the nickel ore in the world? It's here in your country, right? So you're going to see a lot more uh, use of HPAL and other technologies to recover nickel for batteries. Um, <coughs> other metals, of course, uh, cobalt. There's the nickel and the lithium again. Graphite for making the electrodes, manganese, iron, phosphorus, and so on. There's going to be an acceleration in demand in all these sectors that we're going to have to meet using our best technologies. <coughs> this is a slide. It doesn't really have a purpose in the presentation, but I just like it because it shows the relative amounts of metals that we mine. Uh, and, and uh, of course, iron and steel is enormous. So decarbonizing iron and steel using hydrogen would make a huge difference to the carbon footprint of the world. Everything else is small potatoes. And these are the specialty metals over here on the right. There's copper. I think that's, um, I can't even read it here. It's a little aluminum. OK, yeah, a little bit uh, but dwarfed by the, the iron and, and, uh, and steel. So if we think of the status report of the health report for the, the planet, you know, carbon dioxide levels are rising in the atmosphere. We're approaching about 40 gigatons per annum of uh, CO2 emission. So we're going to have to reduce carbon emissions, and we're also going to have to enable carbon removal from the atmosphere. Metal mining and processing is carbon intensive, so we need lower carbon pathways. We have uh, about one-third renewables in our electricity generation currently, and that's increasing, which is good. And metal supply is going to have to increase dramatically to enable electrification just of the transport sector. So I think the golden age of hydrometallurgy is upon us because many of the metals that we need to recover are going to be recovered hydrometallurgically. So the hydrometallurgist of the next generation is going to meet some of these challenges. So how can pressure hydrometallurgy help? What's pressure hydrometallurgy? Well, we can cook in an open pot or we can cook in a closed pot. All right, an open pot is limited by atmospheric pressure which means that when the water boils, the temperature reaches the maximum and doesn't go any higher. As soon as you put a lid on the pot, then you can go to very much higher uh, temperature and pressure, limited by the mechanical uh, construction of your pot to make sure it doesn't blow up. Okay, we don't want that to happen. That's a bad, bad situation. So pressure hydrometallurgy is conducted in autoclaves. <coughs> so why would you use an autoclave in hydrometallurgical processing? Well, it gives you the ability to increase the temperature, which increases the reaction rates generally. So every 10 degree rise in temperature doubles the rate of the chemi chemical reaction. This is just a very rough rule of thumb. Uh, sparingly soluble gases can be increased in concentration and solution by applying an overpressure of the gas. So we can push more reactant into the fluid. Uh, iron precipitation reactions and other precipitation reactions are favored at higher temperature which helps us with waste generation or waste rejection. And residues produced by 
pressure leaching are more stable the atmospheric residue, so it's better th for the environment. We might be able to fully oxidize sulfur at high temperature, which reduces the acid uh, generating potential of the residues. And of course, we can maximize extraction or recovery by completing the reactions to a greater extent at higher temperature. So this shows the um, sort of the range of conditions we use for pressure leaching. <coughs> so this is the, the water vapor pressure plotted against temperature. And the, the circles show the vapor pressure of water as steam as a function of temperature. And so you can see that um, when you approach 100 degrees C, you're sitting at about 100 kPa pressure. And then as you go above 100 degrees Celsius, the pressure rises. And then it goes very rapidly to very high temperatures and pressures. So medium temperature pressure leaching for metal sulfides like nickel, copper, or zinc sits at about 150 degrees Celsius, about 500 kPa. Uh, pressure oxidation for copper or gold at lower temperatures, the light condition, uh, about 190 and about 1300 atmospheres, 1300 kPa. Uh, total pressure oxidation for gold or copper, sitting at about uh, 225 degrees C and 2500 kPa. And then here's the H, H pal for nickel laterite sitting at about 250, sometimes a little higher, sometimes a little bit lower. But now we're talking over 4,000 kilopascals of pressure in order to contain that reaction. So that's a very thick-walled pot, right? You've got to have a lot of containment for that sort of pressure at that sort of temperature. And of course, the cost of the autoclaves goes up dramatically with increasing temperature and pressure. Uh, what about um, gas solubility? Well, this shows oxygen solubility at elevated temperature and pressure. So this is oxygen solubility in water at one atmosphere, five atmospheres, and 10 atmospheres. So as we push the temperatures higher and the pressures, the overpressure of the gas higher, we can get more oxygen in solution, which accelerates the reactions. Here's a picture of an autoclave coming to uh, a couple of autoclaves. This one is in Australia at Murrin Murrin. So it's going across the outback. And this is the Ambatavi autoclave going into Madagascar, just off the southern tip of uh, Africa. Okay, very large pots uh, being put into service for pressure leaching of, of nickel laterites. So I want to talk briefly about three different applications, copper, lithium, and nickel and cobalt. <coughs> so in terms of copper autoclaving, there's a lot of developments over the years in copper. Um, First one is the Mount Gordon autoclave in Australia. You can see this is like a baby autoclave, 90 degrees Celsius, eight atmospheres of pressure. The goal there was to leach calcocyte in a, in a high iron environment. And the autoclave was used to accelerate the rate of reaction and to get gas to dissolve faster to drive ferrous to ferric regeneration. Sipon up in Laos, 225 degrees C, 30 atmospheres pressure, full oxidation of a pyritic material in order to make acid and uh, heat to support a reaction. Uh, Baghdad in the United States, one of the Freeport operations, 225 degrees C and 30 atmospheres. Again, fully oxidized the, the copper ore. Uh, Marinci, a couple of different versions there at medium temperature and higher temperature, and one also in Brazil. This is the Mount Gordon site in Queensland with uh, one of the first pressure autoclaves for copper, operating over the period 1998 to 2002. <coughs> the autoclaves are shown, it's hard to see them here, but they're just horizontal reactors, quite small. They operate at 90 degrees Celsius. The ore comes in here from a, a belt, goes through the autoclaves, oxidizes. These are cooling towers. That's a filter at the back, or cooling tanks, not towers. That's a filter at the back. And then over to the right, not shown, is, uh, is the solvent extraction and electrowinning. Uh, Sipon and Laos, here's a picture of the flow sheet. The ore went through the, the plant this way. So the ore was crushed, milled. Uh, there was a surge tank, and then it was heated, uh, leached atmospherically, and then cooled. And then the solution carrying copper was recovered by a CCD 
to go through SXEW to make cathode. And then right at the end of the circuit here, we used a flotation step to recover sulfur and pyrite, which then went up to a high pressure autoclave shown just here. So the autoclave was like, in this case, was like a chemical factory sitting on the side of the plant that was used to make acid, ferric sulfate, and heat, which supported the needs of the main circuit here. And this is a picture of the plant in Laos in uh, Southeast Asia. This is the mining operation up here at the top. The uh, uh, ROM pads are here for the copper ore. This is the milling and leaching. You can see the CCD thickeners here. And then the SX, this is the SX, this is the EW. And then this is the uh, autoclave area, which was used again to make the acid, ferric sulfate, and heat. And this is the auction plant that was supplying the autoclave over here. And there's just a couple of different notes there. This is the, uh, the Baghdad Freeport plant in uh, North America, treating copper concentrate at high temperature and pressure. And this shows a wonderful slide of what happens in one of these autoclaves. So this is the copper concentrate coming in. It's oxidized at high temperature and pressure, and it produces a blue copper sulfate solution that also carries acid. The iron minerals that are present in the concentrate, the calcopyrite, is oxidized and precipitated as hematite. So at high temperature and pressure, the hematite precipitation is favored, so we end up with a nice rejection of iron. Um, Renzi was another plant, uh, and Cecil was another plant just there. Uh, lithium. So how do we get lithium? Well, we either get it nowadays from uh, salars, which are salt lakes, basically, that carry high concentrations of lithium in the brine, or we process minerals like uh, spodumene, which are first roasted and then treated, sometimes with acid, and probably in the future increasingly under uh, uh, alkaline conditions. So the Metso Autotech group has come up with a process to treat beta spodumene using high pressure leaching, uh, using alkaline processing. So how does this work? <coughs> well, the beta spodumene, which is the reactive form of spodumene that's been treated thermally, is contacted with sodium carbonate in a pressure leach. And the pressure leach, again, runs up to around 250 degrees Celsius. What happens is the sodium from the sodium carbonate goes into the spodumene mineral and pushes out the lithium. So you, you, st you start with a lithium mineral and you finish with a sodium mineral with the lithium now in solution. <coughs> the, the slurry from the pressure leach is then treated with lime and the lime converts the lithium carbonate to lithium hydroxide. Okay, and the lithium hydroxide is then crystallized as a lithium hydroxide uh, monohydrate which then goes off into the battery industry. So pressure leaching enabling recovery of lithium from this uh, spodumene mineral. What about uh, nickel and cobalt? Well, a lot of activity historically and uh, currently, as you know, in Indonesia, very active. <coughs> so in terms of, of uh, the sulfide forms of nickel and cobalt, going back to the 1950s, there was pressure oxidation for uh, copper, nickel, and cobalt uh, types of concentrates. There was a plant in Finland that was built many years ago, the Heiko process plant, that did low temperature leaching of nickel sulfides, followed by uh, solvent extraction for salt recovery, often what we're trying to do nowadays. The Sherrod ammonia pressure leach was started in, in Canada in 1950s, uh, worked in Australia in the 1970s, and is still operating today. And then the Valet Company, they have a large deposit in uh, eastern Canada, um, called Voise Bay, and they take that concentrate and they pressure leach it using sulfate and chloride solutions in order to recover nickel metal and cobalt metal at the plant. For laterites, uh, the start of the HPAL was actually in a, in a site in Cuba back in the 1960s. <coughs> Moa Bay was the site, and it was the Freeport Company, the Freeport Sulfur Company at the time, that built the plant. Of course, when the revolution happened in, in Cuba, uh, Freeport left and the Cuban company came in, uh, but it's still operating to this day. And then over the years, there's been many other attempts to use HPAL. Uh, Murin Murin, Australia, Ravensthorpe, Australia, Goro, New Caledonia, Rio Tuba and Taganito in the Philippines, and Batavi, 
and then the chapter is still being written on all the plants that will be built in uh, Indonesia. Okay, and then maybe to finish my, my talk, I just want to talk a little bit about some work we're doing uh, at, at UBC using pressure leaching with CO2 as the reaction gas in order to recover nickel and cobalt from nickel laterite ores. My uh, colleague, Fei uh, Wang, who was my PhD student, now a professor at Laval University, and I prepared uh, these slides. <coughs> so when you look at CO2, now we mentioned the challenge, 40 gigatons a year of extra CO2 going to the atmosphere. Where can we put that CO2? Well, on the planet, we've got a large amount of basic silicate rock that is widely distributed over the, the Earth's crust. <coughs> so if we take those silicate rocks and expose them to CO2, we'll convert the metals to carbonates, and of course the silica, silicate will become silica. Why doesn't that work effectively? Well, it's too slow. We've got to make it go faster. Okay, we have plenty of capacity to pick up the CO2 from the atmosphere. We just have to deliver the CO2 effectively to the, the rock in order to get decarbonization. And of course, the silicate minerals can also contain uh, critical metals. So maybe while we're fixing carbon, we can also recover the metals at the same time. So we want to tie together um, a solution to CO2 with the economic feasibility to also recover metals of value. <coughs> so a little bit of a complex flow sheet here, but if we're trying to reduce CO2 emissions, we've got a couple of different ways to do this. We're trying to do what we call ex situ, direct mineral carbonation, where we mine the rock and then treat it in an engineered process, and at the same time try to recover the battery metals, nickel, cobalt, and copper, uh, from the, the uh, raw material. Okay, so we started with the mineral olivine. So olivine is a, a, a magnesium iron silicate. And if we treat that material at high temperature and pressure with CO2 as, as the gas, what will happen? Well, the CO2 goes into solution to make bicarbonate. The bicarbonate reacts with the uh, olivine and forms magnesium carbonate and iron carbonate. It will also form... Uh, nickel and cobalt carbonate, if there's nickel and cobalt present. But if we put a chemical in called uh, NTA, the NTA will actually selectively complex the nickel and the cobalt and keep them in solution. So we're working on a way to use CO2 in a reactor, in a pressure reactor, to carbonate a rock and at the same time try to recover the nickel and the cobalt as separate complexes. And this, this uh, works. How does that then translate to a process? Uh, well, ol olivine, if I go back one slide, olivine is a mineral that contains low levels of nickel and cobalt. The nickel content is maybe 0.2 to 0.3% uh, nickel. So we turned our attention to nickel laterites, and what we find is if we calcine or reduce those laterites, like you would do at an RKF plant, where you would pretreat them to dry them and, and partly reduce them. You can then take that material and go into an autoclave where we're adding sodium bicarbonate and uh, CO2 to mineralize the magnesium and iron as carbonates and leach the nickel and cobalt into solution. So we get a nickel and cobalt rich pregnant leach solution and then we recover nickel and cobalt from that solution and then we recycle the chemicals back around again. And the only reagent that we have to add here is the CO2. The NTA and the sodium bicarbonate are recyclable around that route. <coughs> so we have a way to economically carbonate uh, a laterite material and at the same time recover nickel and cobalt as products for sale. The um, types of results that we get, this is Dr. Wang's work, we get about 94% nickel extraction 92% cobalt extraction, and 47% CO2 mineralization <coughs> with very low levels of iron and magnesium extraction. We choose this chemical NTA that was referred to as a complexant that selectively recovers the nickel and cobalt and leaves the iron and magnesium 
as carbonates in the residues. Um, so here's some materials that we studied. There's an olivine and a saprolite and a limonite. So the olivine you can see is quite low in nickel, the saprolite much more attractive. This is a sample from New Caledonia and the limonite about 1.16% nickel, so also very attractive as a, as a material. There's a lot of detail on the mineral composition which I won't dwell on. <coughs> and then um, when you do olivine uh, in the autoclave, this is what you see. So this is the extraction of nickel and cobalt and also the, the degree of mineral carbonation shown here on the right hand side in green. The important thing is that the curves are rising for the nickel and cobalt and the carbonation and the iron and magnesium are not extracted. <coughs> okay, and this um, is a similar uh, type of process here. Because olivine is fairly low in nickel, for one ton of rock we get this much nickel, this much cobalt, and this much CO2 per ton of the olivine in about a five hour period. The re residues are mainly mineral carbonates and amorphous silica. If we take um, limonites, which are the iron rich portion of the nickel laterite, um, if we take raw limonite, you can see that the reactivity is fairly poor. So the nickel is the black. You can see only 32% nickel extraction in the process using raw limonite. But if you calcine the limonite first, then you get, in this case, 87% and 81% for the nickel and the cobalt with low levels of um, iron and magnesium and significant increase in the degree of carbonation. <coughs> okay, and this one, uh, same sort of thing the raw limonite and the, and the pretreated limonite, there's a, a greater amount of CO2 sequestration that takes place. So here's the results, and now a lot more nickel and cobalt, somewhat less CO2 fixation because there's less magnesium present, and the residues, again, mainly contain mineral carbonates, uh, quartz, and amorphous silica. And then for the saprolites, again, poor uh, reactivity in the raw form, but after drying and heating, you can see now we're up at the 94 and 92% uh, nickel extraction. <coughs> and now significant amounts of nickel and cobalt coming out and significant amounts of CO2 being sequestered uh, by the material. I think that should say per ton of saprolite, actually. Okay, and then how do you recover the nickel and cobalt? Well, one of my students, unfortunately, asked her to study solvent extraction for nickel and cobalt from the solutions from the autoclave the NTA that binds with the nickel and cobalt is so strong that it's hard for the solvent extraction to recover the nickel and cobalt away from the NTA. So we found the only way we can recover the nickel and cobalt so far is by sulfide precipitation. So the, the nickel and cobalt sulfides form so strongly that when we add H2S, we can make a nickel and cobalt sulfide, which then produces a solution that can be recycled back to the autoclave. And we produce a high quality nickel sulfide concentrate there is still some iron in the concentrate, but the, the ratio to nickel of nickel over iron is favorable, much more nickel than iron. And then when we re recycle, you can see that we're getting effectively the same results with the fresh solution and the recycled solution. So the NTA is going around and around, we hope, in order to uh, come up with a, a low cost process. So this just shows that if you start with olivine, you don't need any pretreatment and you end up with um, magnesite siderite and amorphous silica, and of course a little bit of nickel and cobalt in solution. If you go through the, the limonite or the saprolite, you have to do the heat treatment first to change the laterite minerals into other minerals, which are more reactive with the CO2, but you end up with the same sort of products over here in the, on the right-hand side. <coughs> and of course the nickel and the cobalt story is the, the NTA keeps the nickel and cobalt in solution, and the H2S recovers the nickel and cobalt as a sulfide, and that's the same through all the different uh, process iterations. So conclusions on the, on the researchy part of it here. Um, the decarbonization of industry, uh, sequestration of CO2 uh, to decrease atmospheric CO2 levels, and the rapid increase in metals demand for copper, aluminum, manganese, nickel, cobalt, lithium are the challenge for the future generation. Uh, pressure hydrometallurgy is a key technology to meet that challenge. So put a lid on the pot and raise the temperature and pressure 
and things go much faster. There's many examples of the use of pressure leaching for uh, copper, lithium, nickel, cobalt, and other metals. And this new process that we're working on, the CMSL process, uh, seems to meet the twin goals of CO2 sequestration and also <coughs> increased metal extraction. So metallurgists work under pressure, better under pressure, and uh, that's the challenge of the future generation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Please, questions. Ooh. One, two, three. Um, actually, guys, this is uh, Dr. Arif. He is just graduated from Alto, and he's the one who responsible for the PT Freeport uh, Manyar project smelter. Welcome, Mas Arif. <laughs> <laughs> we have two, and also, uh, and yes, you can go to Alto and become like Pak Arif. <laughs> and in the back, uh, there is Fahmi, actually the student of Professor Kang. Can you stand up? Also coming here. So you can join to to Korea also and Pak Akbar like Epma, okay? And uh, and Canada like Mas Reza, okay? But Pak Arif is a student association. But because you are from Petty Report and you are the sponsor, the main sponsor, <laughs> I will give you a question later. But first, for student, the microphone is there, I think. Microphone? Yes? Yeah. Please. Yes, the back one who raised the hand. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I want to ask if. Hey, can you introduce yourself? What's your oh. name? Yes. Yeah. My name is Daniel Irawan, and I'm final year of uh, Metallurgical Engineering Department. And my question is Is there. Is it possible if the process is we're not using a, a pressure vessel, but we pump the. CO2 gas gases straight to the the mineral vein to make the process happen. Since uh, the since the pressure would be uh, provided by the rock on on top of it, uh, I just think uh, maybe it is is it uh, maybe possible or not? That's my yeah. question. Thank you for the question. So I think in in some other versions of carbon storage technology, what people do is they pump CO2 under pressure underground into olivine rock. So we know if we put um, uh, CO2 into the, into the earth and react it with olivine, the CO2 will eventually carry out the same reaction. It will make uh, mineral carbonates and silica. Yeah. Of course, in that case, you don't recover any nickel and cobalt. All you do is you store the CO2 underground in the, in the form of carbonates. Um, I think the, you know, you talk about the pressure of the rock at, at depth in the earth, which is, is correct, but if you want to get the CO2 in, into that system to react, you've also got to provide it under great pressure. So you can't just put CO2 at atmospheric pressure if you want to get it into the depths of the earth. You have to actually push it under very high pressure. So you don't escape the pressure use by putting it in that way, and you don't get the benefit of nickel and cobalt recovery. So we think doing it in an autoclave gives us gives us both things at the same time. Gives us the nickel and the cobalt and the CO2 sequestration. Okay? Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, last question from Pak Arif. Because I'm afraid that you don't give money. <laughs> 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 the money is not transferred yet, by the way. <laughs> Please, Pak Arif. <laughs> a, a, true, a true professor. There you go. <laughs> Hello, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Arif. Uh, I'm from uh, Freeport Copper Smelter in Manyar. So, yeah, uh, I have one question, uh, David. I think uh, I met you first uh, time like seven years ago. Like we stayed in this uh, hotel in Sawangalin for the first conference, right? First one here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Hey, sorry, 10 years. Yeah, seven years. Seven years. Seven years. Yeah, seven yeah. years ago. Uh, yeah, so my question is like uh, you highlighted the CO2 
overview of process. I mean, uh, in process, there are like uh, a lot of things outside CO2, uh, water consumption, energy consumption, uh, etc. So here I have you uh, proposing a high pressure leaching for copper, and I have PECA with a, let's say, conventional copper smelter process that we also built in Manyar. So I don't want uh, to, uh, how to say, to argue with you guys, but then, so what is your overview about the whole process of uh, copper sulfide? Is it like hydro is better than pyro or, or no. vice versa? <laughs> Please take a look. Well. Pyro guys and hydro guys. <laughs> We'll meet at the back later and fight. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I think the, the answer to that question is pretty clear. If you look around the world now, most of the world's copper is made by pyro, right? And I, I don't see that changing anytime soon because the smelters can be very large. Your smelter is 500,000 tons per year of, of copper. So you have fantastic economy of scale and very efficient processes to make good quality copper, recover your gold and your silver and your minor elements, make a stable slag and make acid in concentrated form. So I, m I imagine the acid that you're going to make from your smelter is going to go to the HPAL plants to feed the acid demands for the HPAL plants eventually. So you have a very good connection between all the things that the smelter produces and all the products that is are needed locally or geographically in the area. When you do pressure leaching of, of copper concentrates, as they did at, uh, at uh, Baghdad, you know all the sulfur goes into solution as sulfuric acid and metal sulfates. Uh, what do you do with that sulfuric acid? Well, in the case of, of uh, Baghdad, they had a heap leaching for copper right next door to the autoclave. So the acid that came from the autoclave could be used for the heap leaching because it was already in solution. So there was an economic use of the acid. But in many other places, that's not available. So if you, in, your, in your location at Grasberg, I don't think you have a need for large amounts of acid to do heap leaching of copper ores. So you'd have, a, you'd have a dilute solution of acid that would have no use to you. So, so it would not be a recommended solution. So generally, hydrometallurgy in copper has been, uh, at least for concentrates, has been kind of uh, uh, selectively applied where there's a unique situation. If you have a difficult mineralogy, a lot of work nowadays going on on high arsenic materials that we don't want to put in the smelter necessarily. That might be a, a way that hydrometallurgy works more effectively for concentrates. But generally speaking, smelting is the winning technology. Okay, and you and you have, you know, pyrometallurgy has very good capture of, of gases and dusts. All the things that used to be problems in pyrometallurgy now are largely solved. It's still a hot and, and uh, somewhat dirty environment to work in, but it's it's so much better than it was 50 years ago. So I think uh, you know the answer is I, I'll, yeah. I'll say that uh, <laughs> they're they're still winning. Now I, I I will I will say. I will say that uh, you know one of the developments at UBC that I didn't talk about today was the development of something called the Jetty Resources uh, Leaching Technology. So what if you didn't have to make a, um, make a concentrate from your ore? Uh, we know that calcopyrite, generally when you do leaching on a heap, it doesn't leach very well. Well, my colleagues uh, David Dixon and Ed Asselin at UBC uh, developed something called the Jetty Leaching Technology, which uses small amounts of catalyst to make sure that calcopyrite leaches effectively. And so they, they've actually f kind of cracked the code, if you will, of how to leach calcopyrite um, in a heap leach to very high extractions. And the company now is a, is a private company. They've been raising money from BHP, from many large companies around the world. And they actually have a number of different sites now that are applying the technology. So hydrometallurgy may still win, but it might take a little longer. <laughs> okay, and, and they have ways also of recovering the gold, they think, from the, from the ore. Pekka. Pekka, have, have, a, have a word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really... I'm 110% uh, agreeing what David was saying, saying that is very much true and, and, uh, and probably we will see expansion of... of concentrate leaching in 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 copper field also in in future but but as as mentioned so it, it is so so uh, specific method that that in large scale uh, copper smelters are copper copper producing uh, facilities so so uh, 
as as mentioned by David, it, it, this is still a couple of tens of years or probably longer, much longer, we see uh, pyrometallurgy as, as the s smelting method and, and then then we then we put that that anode into 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 water solution and, and refine it uh, refine it in aqueous phase so so yeah in in real kind of smelting community or copper making community there is no practical competition in in, in this this respect <laughs> okay thank you. God, thank you okay guys give applause For the final concluding remark, I request Pak Zul, Pak Zul to give a concluding remark for this today's session. Please, Pak. Okay. Bisa saya ditagi dulu sih. Saya sudah nggak mau. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Pak Imam uh, Santoso, for uh, organizing this uh, event. Actually, this pen uh, was conducted for the first time in 2013. At that time, we invited uh, Professor Brooks, Professor Kang, and Professor Akbar to Indonesia. At that time, it's, uh, the seminar is actually not international; it's seminar, uh, it's national. So we invite at that time we invite. It's like a, actually an international seminar because we invite also many uh, lecture from from uh, the other country. Uh, most of them was conducted in Vasa, Indonesia, <laughs> but for for the keynote speaker and also for the invited speaker, the lecture was given in English. So again, uh, thank you very much for your second coming here, uh, Professor Kang, for this event. But Professor Akbar, I think, is every two years, <laughs> oh, every year, <laughs> maybe uh, in one year, three times uh, to Indonesia, Professor Akbar to the other uh, event also at Brain and also in the other university. And uh, Professor uh, David Dreisinger, I think this is the second time for you to be here. And last time was in 2016 at the first uh, IPMC in 2016. You have also given this lecture also similar to what we have conducted this day. Yeah, you have given also the lecture in this room. I remember also at that time you have made also the comparison between pyrometallurgy and hydrometallurgy. <laughs> <laughs> the same discussion like today. And uh, at that time I remember that we have said that uh, we have developed a good uh, hydrometallurgical processes for many metals, but at the end we cannot compete with the pyrometallurgy processes. <laughs> 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 Okay. Just for copper, okay. Oh, correct, correct. Just for copper, yeah. For, for copper, yes, correct. Because uh, actually, both technology, pyrometallurgy and uh, hydrometallurgy, we should uh, use uh, both kind of technology. And uh, this technology is not compete with the other. Okay. It's to complement with the other. Uh, some metal, for example, gold, yeah. never. We <laughs> use pyrometallurgy for gold processing, for example, never. And uh, similar also for iron, I think only a small portion. We use the process, uh, uh, what you call electrolysis at room temperature and only small portion, but a huge amount of uh, iron is produced by pyrometallurgy. It depends on the metals, uh, what we want to extract. Uh, yeah, Daniel, maybe for you, it's for the first time in Bandung, uh, Indonesia, uh, also Katri also, yeah? <laughs> for the first time here in Indonesia, Professor uh, Pekaraskin, we have already met uh, a lot of time here. I think you were also in uh, the first IPMC 2023. No. Eh, 2016, sorry, 2016 uh, for the first time. And at that time, uh, you went to Indonesia together with Imam from, yes. from Finland, yeah? From Finland to Bali, I think, yeah? Bali <laughs> one, one day, and then you come to, to Bandung in 2016. Uh, so today, uh, we have actually a very good uh, lec lecture. Uh, you have heard the lecture from Professor Kang about thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is very important uh, because uh, if we told them to learn thermodynamics, they say, ah, it's really there's a lot of formula inside. <laughs> 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 a lot of formula. And you say to us, uh, uh, to our, our what to call lecture here at ITB is crazy with a lot of formula. We cannot remember everything. Uh, 
<laughs> but it's just basic. The thermodynamics is actually the, the basic uh, for us, for metallurgy. And after that, we should understand also about the kinetic and also transport phenomena. And after that, we can learn uh, further into the each process from mineral processing, uh, hydrometallurgy, pyrometallurgy, including also physical metallurgy, casting, etc. Yeah? As metallurgists, you should understand the whole thing uh, as information. Uh, some of them are now in the second year student. Yeah, which one? Is second year student now? Second year? No. <laughs> Only one, two, <laughs> and uh, the third year student, oh, most of them, and the fourth. Oh, yang tingkat dua malah nggak ada ya. Okay, master student, one, two, three, well, uh, not much. Yeah. <coughs> Now again, uh, thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, I think uh, the lecture is uh, a good benefit from our for our student. Uh, I hope that uh, they can get a lot of information, and later on in the future they can uh, further study in, uh, for example, in South Korea, in uh, Finland, Australia, in Canada as well. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, guys, let's give again very big applause to professors because they are, it's difficult for them to come here. They have to uh, spend some time flying for 20 hours more, even still jet lag, and they come here and give important lecture to you. So again, give applause. And tomorrow, again, they have to give Kind of speaker, they have to attend the lecture. So we are really appreciate uh, to to you all, Professor. And for go to mention also, Professor Sadia, please stand up. She also will give a lecture tomorrow as kind of speaker, and with Dr. Rajiv also. So again, guys, uh, this is very important. I hope it can motivate you, and how blessed you are become a metallurgical student. Yes or not? Still under pressure. Oh my gosh! And again, I, re I really appreciate that. Yes, now you are can sustain under pressure because normally later is only two hours and they are sleeping, and you still awake. It means you are excellent. <laughs> and again, thank you very much to the sponsor here: PT Freeport, PT Aman, Jinpeng, DKSH, Antamuko Indo, and then ITB, PT Timah, Siemens, Mitso, Sefar, Krakato Postco, and also media partner we have CNN, and also uh, Majalah Tambang, Pikiran Rakyat, Campus Update, and <laughs> as well, I can say. I hope he is not angry. And yeah, Dilamaneha uh, Radio. Okay. Okay, guys, give applause to us. And again, thank you very much. And let's close this moment. From me, Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yeah. Yes, it's over, guys. <laughs>